The Thursday, October 24th, 2019, regular meeting of the Brisbane Planning Commission will now come to order. May I have roll call, please? Yes, uh, Commissioner Gomez? Here. Commissioner Gooding? Here. Commissioner Mackin? Here. Commissioner Patel? Here. And Chair Sayasan? Here. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda, please? I make a motion to adopt the agenda. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Consent calendar. Is there anyone who would like to remove an item from the consent calendar? I see no one. May I have a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oral communications. Is there anyone who would like to address the commission about an item that's not on tonight's agenda? Okay, I'll move on to written communications. We have none, so we'll uh, go on to the next item on the agenda, which is a public hearing concerning interim use permit UP-7-19, and that is a continuation of UP-4-18 concerning the Baylands east of Bayshore Boulevard between Ice House Hill and the Caltrain Rail Lines, C-1 Commercial Mixed Use District. The applicant is seeking an interim use permit to allow the previously approved interim use to continue through December 2020 to allow outdoor staging of construction materials and equipment and assembly of work trains and rail track segments on an approximately 3.5 acre vacant site with an existing rail spur to support improvements along the Cal train rail line corridor. Zach Mays is the applicant and Universal Paragon is the owner. Staff, may, may we have a report? Yes, thank you. An interim use permit is requested by Proven Management Incorporated or PMI to continue to utilize the three and a half acre vacant yard between Ice House Hill and the Caltrain tracks as a staging and construction assembly area for Caltrain improvements. This request would be a continuation of the use that was approved in September of last year. A time extension through December of 2020 is requested due to Caltrain delays and additional work scope requested by Caltrain to PMI. The Caltrain project that the staging, staging yard supports includes various improvements for Caltrain electrification to improve system efficiency and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. These improvements include enlarging tunnel clearances and installation of overhead catenary system, which is the overhead electrical power systems. Use of the site would be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as detailed in the uh, project description. The site is largely within the former cut area of Ice House Hill from when the rail, rail line was established in the early 1900s. The Kinder Morgan Tank Farm is located opposite the Caltrain right of way from the site to the east and southeast. Five sets of rail line tracks are located along the Caltrain right of way immediately adjacent to the site. And an existing rail spur connects directly to that westernmost track to provide access to the proposed project. Roadway access to the site is from a private driveway that runs behind the Brisbane Fire Station and intersects down at uh, to the south on Bayshore Boulevard. The site has been in use for the last year. It's been hardened with gravel and has a portable office in place, toilets, uh, temporary lighting and fencing, as well as a temporary water supply for dust control. The scope of work on the site has shifted away from staging of, of concrete and debris from, from the um, past ac activities and have to assembly for these uh, structural improvements in the electrification of the, along the corridor. The materials would be delivered to the site via flatbed trucks and deployed along the rail line on what's called a consist of four to five rail cars. The uh, electrical support systems would be partially assembled on the site prior to deployment. The work would continue to be 24 hours a day, seven days a week as previously permitted and as outlined in the report. In 2018, the estimate, estimated vehicle trips were 200 a day. That's being reduced to 100 trips a day now. Uh, vehicle access um, 
security dust control would continue as previously proposed. There are a few required findings for granting an interim use permit and um, those were covered in the agenda report. I won't repeat all of that here, but I'll just comment that the continue of the use would benefit the public and that the construction yard would continue to support the Caltrain electrification improvements, which are aimed again at improving the system's operational efficiencies and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Finally, this application was routed to all the responsible city departments as well as San Mateo County Environmental Health, Regional Water Quality Control Board, and Caltrain Joint Powers Board. There were no objections to the continuation of the use and conditions of approval are included in the resolution. So in closing, staff recommends conditional approval of use permit UP 719, which would extend the original approval of UP 418, the adoption of the resolution. Thank you, Ken. Is there any follow-up questions for staff? Nope. Commissioner Mackin? Ken, just two quick questions. Um, number one, the temporary water connection, is that water being metered? Yes. Thank you. Second question, um, due to the hours of operation and since the original permit, I, I barely have heard anything, but recently I've heard the trains a lot. And I wondered, had we registered complaints about noise? I'm just curious. I, I have not heard any complaints. Uh, so nothing from this end. We have police here. I don't know if you got anything from them. No, nothing from the police. Here. Okay, because I'm not in as close proximity, say, as the ridge, so I didn't know if, if there were operations at night that maybe they were being disturbed by. But thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, we'll open up the public hearing. Um, may we hear from the applicant, please? Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm Zach Mays. Um, the permit applicant, uh, Ken described the permit well. Um, we were given a change order by Caltrain uh, to install the overhead electrical components um, for the electrification of the overall corridor. Uh, the tunnel sections are a little bit different from the rest of the corridor, um, so they've lumped that in with our tunnel improvement project, which was our original uh, interim use permit from 2018. Uh, there's a couple items from that original contract that have yet to be completed, um, so we will also uh, finish up those items as well. Um, everything is driven by Caltrain's revenue service. That's why uh, the requested use is 24 hours a day. We are restricted by Caltrain uh, when we can work and when it's most efficient and effective for us to go to work. Um, primary work activities will be uh, at night from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m., uh, but once we mobilize out of the interim, uh, the staging area, all activity will be within the tunnels. Sound is pretty well confined within those tunnels. There will be um, eight to ten uh, weekend shutdowns where Caltrain will not run train service so we can have full use and occupancy of those tunnels um, to really get some work done and do some very um, complicated and detailed installations that we need to occupy uh, both tracks for. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the applicant? No? Okay, thank you very much. I have one quick question. Um, this extension, basically, for here, <clears throat> is it because of the, the work in the next year is going to be any any different in, in kind or in, in, you know, from what's been going on for the last year or two? Or is it essentially just more of the same? No, the, the work scope is significantly different. Um, last year's permit uh, involved a lot of uh, earthwork, if you will, um, notching the tunnels to create wider clearances, ripping out the old tracks and ballast. So we needed real estate to store, um, you know, exported and imported materials. That um, heavy off-haul and in-haul is done. This is a lot of steel components. There's going to be these big massive steel structures outside each tunnel. And then there's going to be these little, uh, they call them drop tubes, about five foot long tubes that are suspended from the ceiling that will support the overhead system. So it's a lot of um, metal, electrical, specialty work, not a lot of heavy equipment, earth-moving uh, stuff as it was last year or 
earlier this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, may I have a motion? Oh, is there anyone else who would like to speak on the issue? Okay, I see no one. May I have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, do we need to discuss this or do I have a motion? I make a motion that we approve interim use permit UP-7-19. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a public hearing regarding interim use permit UP-4-19, and this is a grading review EX-3-19 regarding 600 Tunnel Avenue in the Bayland sub area, a vacant site south of the Golden State Lumber Storage Yard between Tunnel Avenue and the Caltrain rail lines. It's a C-1 commercial mixed-use district. The applicant is seeking an interim use permit to allow staging of up to 90 Google commuter buses to serve Peninsula Google employees on an approximately three acre vacant site for up to five years, including preparatory site grubbing and approximately 4,500 cubic yards of grading with base rock. Eric Aronson is the applicant and Oyster Point Properties, Universal Paragon is the owner. Staff, may, you have, may we have a report? Yes, thank you. An interim use permit and grading review is requested by Universal Paragon on behalf of Google to allow for utilization of the vacant site at 600 Tunnel Avenue as a staging yard for up to 90 Google commuter buses. Prior to parking buses on the site, it would be prepared by grading of approximately 4,100 cubic yards with most of that being placement of base rock on this relatively flat site. The requested term of the interim use permit would be for five years. Parking or staging of buses would be allowed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The daily vehicle trip schedule in and out of the site was provided in the agenda report and I'll discuss that more in a moment. No utilities or office facilities are proposed with this site. Please. This is a photo taken uh, about a month ago at the looking north to, uh, actually, excuse me, south across the site. The site area is vegetated with coyote brush scrub and grasses that have grown on the soil cap over the landfill following cessation of the landfilling in the area in the mid 1900s. Also, the city's biological consultant for the Baylands has previously identified seasonal wetlands in the areas east and west of the site but the use would not encroach into these areas. The site is approximately three acres in size and is located south of Golden State Lumber Storage Yard between Caltrain and uh, Lyons and Tunnel Avenue. And it's on the western edge of the former municipal landfill or closed landfill. Most of the parking area will be set back from Tunnel Avenue by approximately 80 to 100 feet and set back from Caltrain by approximately 40 to 115 feet. The site would run parallel with Tunnel Avenue with one-way entrance from Tunnel at the north end and an exit one way at the south end of the site. Prior to start of operations, the site would be prepared, as I mentioned, for parking the buses. This would include grubbing the vegetation and laying base rock across the site with that uh, 4,100 uh, roughly cubic yards of, of base rock. A six foot high chain link fence would be placed around the perimeter of the site and it would have a manually operated uh, lockable gate at the driveway entrances. Uh, solar powered temporary lighting standards would be placed on the site as shown on the applicant's plan. Um, per the draft condition of approval, also I should mention prior to preparing this site, the nearby wetlands would be marked by the project biologist to the satisfaction of the community development director. And that would be to prevent any inadvertent disruption of those areas during site preparation work. In, use, in terms of the day-to-day -day operations, the buses would be picked up and dropped off, dropped off by 
Google contracted bus drivers Monday through Friday. This would be between 3 and 7 a.m. and 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. Drivers would arrive by personal vehicle um, or other means and park their vehicles in place of the Google buses there on the site. Since the buses have self-contained lavatories and recycling containers, none of these facilities would be placed outside on the site. Also, no vehicle maintenance would be condu conducted on site. No permanent employees would be located on site either, but it would be patrolled by Google's contracted security officers. And also solar uh, lighting would be installed uh, or placed on site. Those would be temporary lighting standards, solar operated. Totally, total daily trips is estimated at approximately 360, including both the vehicles to and from the site and the bus trips in and out. Note that in response to one of the commissioner's questions yesterday, I provided a supplemental map and a annotated schedule. You had the schedule in your packet, but I, I marked that up to hopefully to be a little bit more clear as to which trips were buses and versus which were personal vehicles. So all the trips, as, as you see in the red and blue lines on this image, would be um, to the north along Beatty Avenue and connecting with 101 at, at those on and off ramps. And I, I won't get into that. You've, you've seen that already. Um, the use permit would be all of the findings for approval. These were outlined in the agenda report, so I won't repeat them all here. But um, the site is surrounded by vacant lands, Caltrain tracks, lumber storage. Um, the closest residential use is approximately a third of a mile away at the Northeast Ridge. Um, the use would not be detrimental to any of these uses or properties. It's temporary in nature. It wouldn't have significant impacts. Uh, also, the number of vehicle trips is not significant, and, and um, the road, roadway infrastructure is already there on the site. And the use um, would help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by taking vehicles off the roadways. Regarding grading, in 2003, the Planning Commission adopted guidelines and findings for review of grading applications based on general plan policies. These were outlined in the agenda report, and the, um, and the application either meets or is not applicable to those findings. And finally, also the uh, various city responsible city departments were consulted, as was the County Environmental Health and Water Board, also Caltrain, JPB, and no objections were, were um, expressed from those uh, agencies or departments. And conditions of approval are included in the, the draft resolution. So in closing, staff recommends conditional approval of UP419 and grading review EX319. Do you have any questions? I'm happy to take them. I have a quick question. Um, do, have we done any study on what the traffic is like on Beatty or Sierra Point during the peak morning hours or um, after work hours? Yes, there was a, the city hired a, a consultant to do a traffic study in 2017. It was part of a, a larger project um, related to the Baylands. And so that we actually did loop in that consultant to look at, at the impacts from this and it didn't rise to any level of significance and would not change the needle in terms of level of service on any intersections. So. Okay. Any questions? A couple Harris? questions. Can, can, um, and this one may be more for the applicant than you. If so, just tell me. Um, 90 buses stored there suggests, uh, is there any provision for fuel storage there or are the buses fueling up elsewhere? It would fuel elsewhere. Um, the traffic uh, the pr proposed route mapping here indicates that the buses are going to go north on tunnel and only north on tunnel to leave and only south from BD to come back. Um, is there any provision or any uh, conditions on what the employees' personal vehicles are going to use to access the site themselves? 
the <laughs> level of traffic was not considered to be significant no matter where it came from, so staff didn't see it necessary to impose conditions. I, I understand though that um, the that Google is is planning to instruct the drivers to use Beatty to the extent that they can and so direct them along that route. But whether they came from other locations or all came through Beatty. It, it and as the buses themselves, is it fair to say that any any deviation from this route by the buses, any deviation from using a uh, tunnel between the site and Beatty um, would be a violation of the permit? No, there's not a condition that they take that route. That's basically just their intended route. But um, if, if the commission felt the need to add such a condition, um, then that that would be up for your discussion. For the buses? For the, for the buses. Um, so what you've shown us here is, is sort of the, the route that they've indicated they might use, will probably use? What's the? Well, I, I think as a practical matter, it's the route that they would use because it's the closest, most convenient route. So I, I don't see that as a, a, an issue. Um, the other route, uh, going southbound on 101, they could go south on tunnel across uh, Lagoon Way and connect up to 101 there. Right. But that's, the, that's the nature of my concern. Yeah. Um, it might be something to ask the applicant to, in terms of, of, you know, what, if there's a concern with, with having a condition, staff doesn't have a, a we didn't impose such a condition just because this this number of vehicles is just does not move the needle in terms of significance and um, so I'm curious about that fairly off hours as well especially in the morning early hours so the the, the bus trips in the morning are, are they cluster at a certain time it, it looked like they went all the way from let's see from 0600 to It's up here. From 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock a.m. Right. So they start between 3 and 4 o'clock with uh, vehicles arriving and start to depart after 4. And they're done basically by 7 in the morning. Or they're out of there, off to employees. And they come back up from, employees. from 3 o'clock all the way through 8 o'clock. Right, so a little bit, which makes sense that returning might be a little bit more spread out in that way. Okay. Okay. Those are those are my factual questions. Thank you, Commissioner Gomez. Any questions? Um, where are the buses being currently stored? I'm not sure. Okay, maybe a question for the applicant. Okay, Commissioner Patel. piece of property? I'm sorry. Is there any toxicity associated with this p particular piece of property? Was it part so of? So this was landfill? part of, this is over the top of the municipal landfill area. There's a soil cap over this area as, as there is for other uses that we've had out there as, as well. This, um, but there's not a, a concern with, um, with this use over the top. It's similar to what Avis, Avis was approved uh, a couple of years ago for a similar sort of use. So will grading any way disturb the soil cap? The grading is just in the root zone essentially to, to get, um, to grub the, the plants out of there and allow for um, placement of the base rock. So there's not a concern with com getting deep enough to get into the landfill area. They've, we've also run this by the water board as well as the county, which has jurisdiction over the, the landfill, and they, they have not indicated any concerns with, with the proposal. Are you done? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Mackin? Thank you, Madam Chair. Ken, do we know if these are diesel buses? 
And if you don't know, we can find out. They're nodding yes over there, yes. Okay, and I noted a provision um, in approval on TransDev in 2016. They've actually been there, I think, since 2009. And they had a lot of diesel vehicles, which they've converted their fleet to gasoline for a lot of minibuses. But they had given the Planning Commission an assurance that there would be no idling beyond five minutes. And I saw nothing in this particular permit mentioning that. So that's that would be a concern. I don't know if these are going to idle. And it has a manual gate. So I'm, I'm a little hamstrung mentally on how if you're driving a bus and you need to get the bus out, you've got to get out of the bus, open the gate. You pull the bus out. Who closes the gate? So that, that was a question I had. Um, the wetlands. You noted on your report that the city's biological consultant had identified the seasonal wetlands. I looked on the attachments and they look like they're about 50 feet away. And I saw nothing verifying that we have revisited the biological consultant to say whether that is an adequate distance, especially if you have idling diesel buses near seasonal wetlands. That's 40, 50 feet away. We we did actually consult with the environmental consultant again on the wetlands to right. to uh, essentially indicate that yes, this this could proceed forward. So I did. I, did he understand what the conditions would be there? Yes. Okay, just seems a little strange to me. Um, okay, has anyone I I noted in here. Um, You've got here the Golden State Lumber Storage Yard is approximately 200 feet to the north. Did anyone speak to them? They would have received a notice of this application, but but um, unless the applicant spoke to them, staff has not staff is not in the practice of reaching out individually to neighbors on an application. Okay, because I saw nothing in here reflecting that, and and we have. Um, to the north of Golden State, I know we have TransDev. To the rear of TransDev, we have Budget Avis. To the north of that, we have Recology, who I recall last December, Recology told us that they had moved or were in the process of transitioning a whole bunch of trucks they used to park at Petrero Hill to Beatty. So we have a lot of new garbage trucks there. And my anecdotal evidence is I spoke to a couple people I know that go really early to work and they said that there are lots of garbage trucks that depart between 4 and 4 and 30 in the morning. Um, let me see what else. Uh, it's noted here that Caltrain requested notification to the residential neighborhood do we know what that was for? Is it just to say there's going to be more traffic? Do we know what their concern was? I think their concern had more to do with uh, the buses actually going even further north versus cutting off across at Beatty. And they have residential neighbors to the north of the Caltrain station that, that would cross those intersections, and I, th I think that's where the, that concern came from. Um, I, I see the buses as actually they're cutting off to the east over to 101 before they even pass Caltrain, but still the condition is, is there. Okay, and the light standards, I studied all of the information that we were provided on that, and it appears to me that these are potentially in a fixed position. Um, I don't know how many would be utilized. I didn't see. Maybe I missed that. I'm rather concerned here about uh, light pollution because that's something that's been a component of a lot of work on open space and a lot of people with sustainability and good practices, and that was included um, as part of this permit that there would be downward facing lighting. So we don't know how many light standards. Are we lighting this up like a 
There, there are 11 light standards that are shown actually on the site plan. Um, and there is a condition, as I recall. I, I mention this also because I did look up, TransDev said that they had four poles. They're connected electrically. And so they're all downward facing like street lamps. And that site is pretty close comparable in size. So it's 11 almost seems a bit like overkill. I mean, do so you really want this all lit up all night? And are the lights on at night, or are they only on until they close the gate at 11 p.m.? So condition F has portable security lighting shall be placed and maintained downwards onto the site and not up or outwards, such that it would present a hazard or significant, significant glare to off-site properties. Any modification to the lighting plan shall be subject to planning director approval. Um, if you wanted to add in some way to that condition about overall lighting levels, um, certainly up to the commission if it wants to go in that direction. Okay. Dust control. There's no portable water there. And I noted that TransDev actually has a water connection. So we're putting a um, base rock surface. How are we going to ensure that we don't get a lot of dust out there if they can't water it down? So the, the base rock itself serves as, a, as dust control. It's not a, a dirt surface at that point that would need to be watered down. Um, and also, I mentioned that this did go to the Public Works Director, City Engineer, for his review as well, and um, would be attuned to uh, dust control and tracking of, of any dirt onto roadways. And, would have enforcement ability over the project on, on those aspects. Okay, and then I'm gonna return back to the wetlands. So right now there's just a lot of scrub brush out there and there's the four wetlands indicated on the attachment we have. When they put a base rock surface down, how do we know where the runoff is going to go? Because once you put any kind of vehicles, anything, you got brake dust, you've got oils, we hear about pollution runoff of everything. So how do we know where that's going to go? Because those biological wetlands are on all around it. So as the idea is that base rock is not a impervious surface. Water can still travel through that. Um, and you still you also have a a fair amount of buffer between the actual surface area and those wetlands as well. So, so that not seeing the concern with that in terms, so it would actually infiltrate into the ground. Okay. Um, that's all I have at this time. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we'll open up the public hearing now. Um, may we hear from the applicant? Hello, uh, my name is Eric Aronson. I'm with Universal Paragon. I have with me Ross Benson. Uh, he's with Google Transportation Team. Uh, I noticed there were some questions directed more towards the, uh, the tenant of ours, so I brought him too. Um, as far as the use, we've been working uh, with Google since uh, very early in this year uh, on the use. Uh, we've been working with staff since around June um, on the site plan, as well as with our consultants. Uh, we've decided to put them along tunnel uh, because the access is convenient uh, to the highway uh, with minimal impact to residents in Brisbane and to surrounding businesses. Uh, the access uh, to 101 is as convenient as it is anywhere in the site uh, that's available to us. Uh, it's about a mile to the highway, a little bit further if you're going uh, to the north, um, but uh, for the most part it is a convenient access point. The site itself is flat um, with the exception of a few small wetland areas, which we have studied ourselves as well, uh, along with staff uh, and their consultants. Uh, we've adjusted the site plan to take into account the wetland areas, uh, to properly buffer them 
uh, with the recommendation of our consultants um, and the site plan has since changed in order to take those considerations into account. Uh, the, bus, the buses that Google plans to park, as far as I know, are diesel. Um, and I think, you know, as far as what the commission, or I should say staff, has requested of them thus far has all been um, agreeable to the tenant and has been agreeable to Universal Paragon as well. Um, so for the most part, it's uh, a pretty straightforward use for us. Um, and we, we hope that the city will accept. Okay, thank you. I have one question. Mm -hmm. So um, in your chart uh, showing how many buses would leave during, let's say, peak hours, you're averaging about 30 buses. So do you know at any one time how many buses would leave? Like, for example, if, if at 5 o'clock, would 10 buses leave at once? Or are you staggering that throughout the hour? I'll let uh, Ross talk based on his experience. Yeah, um, so, so naturally they're just given the schedule, they are staggered. I mean, at any given time, I mean, this is something that we could probably find out and make a kind of best guess for you, but I would say never more than five buses would leave at one time. And some of that's just a function of the way that the lot's set up. It's gonna kind of naturally meter that flow out of the lot. So um, yeah, but I, I mean, I'm, I can't imagine a scenario where there would ever be more than, than five buses at one time. Okay, but is, is that a guess or, I mean, because I just don't want a situation where, you know, let's say all the buses are leaving on Beatty at once and yeah. then there's like a, a traffic, you know, like right, absolutely. congestion. So in, yeah, and so of the, the 90 buses that we have proposed, and that's kind of the maximum capacity, we probably, won't, we, I mean, I know we won't be there on, on day one, assuming this is, is, is approved. Um, and they really are e pretty evenly distributed over, over that period of time that we've outlined. So again, I, I mean, I don't, not without, you know, we'd have to update travel times based on the site and not without studying that. I, I can't give you a firm, like a firm answer on that, but um, knowing what I know, I've been, I've been managing the system for about eight years. Um, I feel pretty confident in that, in that number. Okay. okay. Commissioner Gooding? Yeah, uh, that was, let me just follow on that question, which is that in the morning hours, you've got a three hour span of 180 minutes and 90 buses which is a bus every two minutes. It's not going to be titrated out pr that precisely. It's going to be stacked up and staggered and stuff. Um, so it would be, I think, helpful to, to get some better idea of how clustered this gets. But that really goes to my earlier question to staff, which is, um, yeah. this probably belongs in my comment section, but I, I think it might be appropriate to think about this route being a, a, re a condition of the permit, because I think for the residents of Brisbane, we use one of the bailouts to not get caught in the increasing stack up of cars on Old Bayshore is to hang a left at, at the crossroads and take Lagoon Road out to 101. Um, having that clustered up with buses would, would have a, a negative impact on, on the residents of Brisbane. So I, yeah, I, I, can, I think yeah. it might be a valid um, thing to d discuss this route as being a condition of the permit. Well, may I? Because I, I guess a counterpoint to that is because I, I draw, I, my work schedule fluctuates a lot, so I see the kind of the ebb and flow and I take a lot of different routes. I have never seen any activity more than a few cars between like 7 and 7.30 on that outlet. So if, if you're saying that you're running these, you know, up to 7 o'clock, I don't see this being a, a bigger issue. But I do have a question because you've got the language in here is up to 90 buses. I don't know if you caught mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So we're assuming we're at 90, but you're, you're saying up to 90. So is it if we approve this, you know, you're slamming them all in there, or is it a gradual phasing? My question is where are all these buses right now? Are they in a bunch of different locations, and then gradually you're migrating kind of your whole fleet here and then this is like the main depot or is this one of many depots? Yes. That's, so I know that's a lot of questions and a lot of comments. I didn't mean to cut you off, Commissioner yeah. Gooding, yeah. but um, that's just, I just wanted to stimulate some more conversation. Yeah. No, it's great questions. And I, if I, just to the routing piece of it again real quick. So I think it's uh, one important piece to note is that all of the buses that will be parked here will be in the morning starting off in San Francisco uh. and then coming south. 
so the, the natural flow i mean there's no there would be no reason for them to take a right out of the lot so they're all, they're they're gonna i mean naturally do what, what we've outlined here and then in the evening they'll be ending in san francisco so they'll be coming from southbound 101 and following that routing so just the the routing makes sense from an intuitive perspective to just to just go that way um okay. and, and then to your question about the where are they coming from so right now they are we, we are scattered in multiple locations we park some at genentech across the freeway oh, okay. uh, we have another uh, location in uh in south san francisco so like okay. the south side of san francisco Got it. Um, and that right now that's about 60 buses so the the thought would be that those 60 on day one assuming approval would migrate over mm. and then the 90 is because that's what we can that's the number of spaces that we can get in that lot oh, got it yeah. and so that gives us a room for you know future growth or so you're not running a fleet of 90 right now that's right North well we have South. i mean or you are we'll be operating out of this location got it so yeah. you're currently your current fleet north south is 90 buses is that what i hear or 60 the, the total the total or you're running 60 buses i'm just saying your daily kind of San Francisco to oh you know. it's far more than that but the number okay. of, so but a lot of we we actually park some buses in the East Bay okay the South Bay those nothing changes with those Got what it. we're trying to do is consolidate the buses that are parking at Genentech okay as well as though at that location in South San Francisco got it and okay. that's the sixty buses okay got it okay thank you for that Commissioner Patel so it sounds as though the proposed route mapping that is illustrated you don't have any objection to that being a condition of the permit that deviation from it would be a violation of the permit i, I have no concern with that okay. um and, th I, and I, I would also say that we have ways of monitoring that so if there's ever if there is ever is some kind of violation reported that's something that we can validate with gps and um so w from an operations perspective there is zero issue with that okay commissioner mackin could you verify whether those are diesel buses they are so they're, they're diesel buses but they are they're renewable diesel so um which i don't know if you guys know anything about renewable diesel but it's manufactured or it's produced from uh bio biomass and mm -hmm. biofeed instead of petroleum so you know it's still burning you know you know out of the tailpipe but it's we think it's slightly better than petroleum-based products and so what would be the maximum idle time so we're yeah and that's a, that's a good question too so we're, we're um you know there's there's a law a five minute idling rule mm -hmm. um, that we have to comply with um, and that's enforced by the um, carb uh, so that, that, that's that holds true across all of our locations and that wouldn't be any different with the, with the site okay thank you any more questions okay thank you thank you um, we have Mary Rogers who would like to speak good evening um, my name is Mary Rogers I live in Brisbane. I've lived here for over 30 years. Um, I'm very concerned about the Google parking lot, um, the potential of having that on Tunnel Avenue. Um, I have a lot of comments, concerns, and maybe just food for thought. Um, first of all, it's up to 90 Google buses. We, we don't control that. 60 are going to migrate over per uh, the previous comments. So you're talking about 90 buses up to 90 driver driver cars. An average bus length is approximately 45 feet. 45 feet times 90 buses is 4,050 feet. An average car is 14 feet. 14 feet times 90 cars is 1,260 feet. That is a total of 5,280 um, feet, which is equivalent to a mile. A mile of traffic. Tunnel Avenue is only a mile and a half. So the congestion will be enormous. Someone made a comment about Tunnel Avenue. It's, it's, I drive it all the time. You, I do too. I take it in the morning and I take it at around 7.05. I take the train. There are a ton of, I see a lot of the lumber trucks unloading. I see a lot of the gasoline trucks coming through. It's, it, it's going to be a cluster for sure. The width of a bus is probably approximately nine to 10 feet. Tunnel Avenue is not made for massive buses going down that road. There are no bike lanes on Tunnel Avenue, no bike lanes. This is a safety issue. 
I take that road, it pro probably takes me five to seven minutes to get down to the train station. I went, once I learned of this Google parking lot, I started watching how many bike riders go down that road. I've uh, observed anywhere from 10 to up to 40 in a five to seven minute time frame taking Tunnel Road. Someone is going to get hurt. We have all those boulders on the right-hand side of tunnel going north. Are they going to go away? There's no shoulders on Tunnel Road for people to pull over. There's not enough room. What is it, three feet for a bike to be away from a vehicle? That's, there, there's too much danger there. There's too much risk. The, the roads are just not wide enough to accommodate large vehicles such as buses and the vehicles that are from the um, businesses on Tunnel Road. Environmental, you pointed out the wetlands, pollution, that's a big concern. The lighting and the effects on the wildlife, the coyotes, the rabbits, what happens to them? The lighting effects on residents. What about the folks up on the ridge? Um, I remember when um, Candlestick Park hosted the 49ers, those lights, I mean, it wasn't too often, but when they were on, that shone right all into the town of Brisbane. It came into my bedroom window. So I can't even imagine if this is a 24-7 operation and the lighting at night, how is it going to affect the folks on the ridge? Because they face that. Um, also, any leaks, oil leaks from these buses, that's, that's going to pollute, pollute the area. And then if the lease, if we do grant them, if you approve it, and the lease is up, what are they going to do with all the rock that they put, they put down? Are they taking it back with them? Traffic. I've already mentioned traffic a few times. Backups are inevitable, right? It's, it's a given. It will get backed up. You can't control them taking, you can't control the drivers, uh, tell them to go down BD. They will, I mean, they have, they have timelines to meet, right? So they will take Shoreline. They will take Bayshore. And that's already backed up with the new um, on-ramp on Bayshore. So it's, it's, it's inevitable. If we think otherwise, we're, we're wrong. And then back to the math. So 90 buses, 10 seconds at a stoplight, that's around a 15-minute wait, right? So it's just, um, it will be a cluster. And I know all the different agencies have, you know, everything is okay to go, but they don't live in Brisbane. I live in Brisbane, and I, I just want to keep it safe. That's, those are my comments. I, Any questions? questions? I have some questions. Yeah. So we didn't ask about lighting. Um, if they were to address lighting at night, would that concern of yours be alleviated? So if they were to I mean, say we're going to turn it's, lights it's, off. It, yeah, so for personally, it's, I don't, I don't look, I no, don't no, have but, a view of that. But, but what I'm so. saying is you, 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 had issue, you had said that that was one of your yeah. concerns. The lighting was one of your concerns. Yeah. If they addressed the lighting, would that? Yeah, if but they how, would, how does the lighting impact um, the natural habitat? Sure, right? we'll, just, we'll just go through all of yeah. those. But if we were to address the lighting issue, that, if they said they were going to turn the lights off at, after a certain amount of time, after a certain time, would that alleviate your lighting concern? Just that one particular concern. Well, um, yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah. So, um, as it relates to the root violations, it seems as though you're saying what you were saying. What I heard you say mm -hmm. was that you were worried that they were going to be taking different routes than the ones that were on 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 this particular map, right? But if we make that as a condition of the permit, that that would be a violation, and therefore the permit would then be. How do you control that, though? So in Brisbane, there's two ways, right? Someone complains, mm. and, and then what they're saying is that they GPS monitor all of their buses, so you would be able to confirm whether or not they were doing the route, whether they were following this route or not, mm -hmm. right? 
So does it's, that, if that's a condition in the permit, would that alleviate that particular rooting no, condition? No, it's still it's still going to be congested on tunnel. It will. It's not fair to it's not fair to the businesses that are there. It's not fair to anyone who takes that road. It's not fair to the Caltrain commuters. It's not fair to the bike riders. So you're not you're not you're not satisfied with the fact that they're going to be staggering the buses from no. leaving. No. And I mean, just take, just envision, just envision 10 buses coming out of that lot. But that's what they're huge. saying that's is they're not all coming out at one time. They're staggering is my understanding. Is, is that right? Yeah. Am I wrong? Yes, that's what that's they said, the yes. Said. Oh, okay. So if they're not all coming out at one time, then I can imagine one bus coming out and then maybe 30 minutes later or an hour later, another bus coming out and that happening over the course of a day. But that's not what you're imagining is happening. The uh, the the stats that I saw were 360 trips per day. Well, during peak hours in the morning, let's say that's it's 30 buses an hour, about so. 30 buses an hour. Yes. Right during prime commute time, when you have several people riding their bikes down tunnel, you have other businesses going down tunnel, and now you have a ton of Google buses going down tunnel. I'm actually surprised that there aren't any other residents here or any people representing uh, businesses on Tunnel Avenue, which makes me question, were they ever notified? You know how I found out? By reading the agenda uh, by the library. So I don't think it was well communicated. I don't. And I think that needs, you need to consider um, reaching out to more folks. Any other questions for Ms. Rogers? No. No. Okay. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Aronson, can you come back up? Or I don't know if, uh, I, I didn't get your name or no, sorry, I'm Ross Benson. Ross, Mr. Benson, uh, maybe you could answer this. So you said that uh, you GPS monitor your buses. Is that is that data, uh, would it be easy for you to provide us with that so that we have some assurances that there's not, devi you know, deviations from the route? So uh, if it was by request, we could like, so if you, in the case where somebody, you got feedback, like hey, on, on Tuesday morning we saw a bus doing this, that's something that we could easily provide. Um, on an ongoing basis, I, I mean, it's certainly possible. I think we just have to figure out what that would, what that mechanism. Yeah, I'm, like. I'm just trying to think of a way that's um, less troublesome for you. Like, it, it, you know, you're, you're Google, so I'm sure yeah. you just have this data. Is there a way for you to just regularly, routinely transmit this to us? Yeah, yes. I, I mean, I think the, for us, it's very simple. I think on your mm -hmm. end, how you receive it and, and, mm -hmm. um, and what application you receive it with, I think is the, is the question. We do something similar with SFMTA, so we're in San Francisco, so we're restricted to certain streets as part of the, the commuter program that they launched several years ago. So all of our routes are actually GPS monitored and we send all that, that feed to the city, to that program. Mm. Um, so I envision we could do something similar. They set up a system on their end where we actually just feed the data into. Okay. So we'd probably, I mean, if, if that was something we wanted to do here or needed to do, that no problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, in, can I just mention really quickly about okay. the lighting too? I think sure. that's one important piece. Um, so really the lighting in the lot is really intended for the driver safety. So like when the drivers are arriving and then like getting into the, walking to the bus, getting into the bus and then at the, and at the end of the night, um, you, you know, walking to their personal car. So it's, it can absolutely be controlled. So, and that would, that was the intention all along. So it wasn't gonna, the lighting's not gonna stay on all night. Uh, so, it, I mean, it would shut down ar around the time that the last driver left the lot and, when, and then it would come back on again in the morning when that first driver got there. So it's really more of a, like a workplace safety condition mm -hmm. for us uh, uh, more than anything. Okay. I would add that the lighting will be definitely directed down. Uh, the intention is not to light up the entire site like a football stadium would mm -hmm. be lit up. It's really, to Ross's point, for, for driver safety, uh, it will only be on when there's personnel on site. Uh, and that reminded me of Commissioner Mackin's uh, question about um, buses entering uh, and how the manual gates would be operated. Uh, the idea is that the first driver who arrives by car 
would open up the gate and enter, and then as drivers were entering, the gate would remain open, and the last driver to enter would then close it at the end, while the gate to leave will remain open until the last driver leaves. And the site was designed with the intention of having enough room uh, between Tunnel Avenue and that gate so that uh, a bus could pull entirely off of Tunnel Avenue uh, to operate the gate. So there would never be a situation where there was a backup along Tunnel Avenue with buses. Um, and the, the gates would be open during business times while, while drivers were coming and going. And then the last one to address is the biking. Uh, I myself bike to work every day uh, on Candlestick, uh, in the Candlestick Point area. Um, I, I understand that concern uh, very well. Uh, what's more concerning to me as a biker, personally, um, is when you're riding between lanes of traffic and parked cars or areas where there's a lot of people coming and going. And what I know about tunnel is that there isn't a lot of driveways along tunnel, especially that are active during the times uh, when uh, the, the buses will be coming and going. Uh, the other thing about tunnel that I feel mitigates that risk is, is the speed of travel. The, the distance along tunnel uh, and along BD for that matter is not significant. Uh, the speed limits are not that significant. I don't expect there would be a huge differential if a bus and a bicyclist were to be riding side by side. And if there was, um, you know, tunnel for the most part is not so, so congested that a bus could not give enough um, you know, pass at a safe distance. Um, so those those are my uh, mitigating factors to that concern as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Is that lighting, the light standards that we were providing in the staff report, are they dimmable? That's a good question. I'm not sure, but we, we can track that down. Are they, I mean, are they set lumens or are they variable according to the user? I, yeah, I, I, we'd have to get back on that. I'd, I read, uh, a little bit about the lights, mm -hmm. um, and it depends on how many light packs you do on any given, um, you know, unit uh, would influence the amount of lumens there are. Uh, you can fluctuate that, and, you know, based on the amount of running time you have, as well as the amount of lead you have. So mm -hmm. um, there would be ways to manage that. But it how, how did you arrive at 11 lights when TransDev has four, and theirs are just like street lights? And they have over a hundred shuttles. I think that there's more than four lights. There's, there's probably four. Howard Pierce, our engineer, he worked mm -hmm. on that. There's probably four light standards, and each light standard has two lights on it. They, they don't have standards. They're using utility poles, standard street lighting. Right, they have, they have a pole right. that has a double mast on it. Mm -hmm. And so the mast, each end of the mast, has a light. So each pole has two lights. Okay, so you're saying eight. Yeah. Do we know that for sure? Um, or if you I had uh, the, the Google Maps right here, I could count them for you. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, uh, what I, what I would say. It's approximately that amount. Okay. Um, the buses are a bit taller than uh, TransDev's buses, mm -hmm. so the thought about putting 11 uh, and sort of looking at the site and where turns are and where entry, you know, having two gates uh, that are a little further apart as well. Uh, we wanted to start with 11. Uh, if the need was less, we would always do less, but we didn't want to request 11, you know, like request four, for example, and need more because we didn't think, well, the tenant didn't think it was safe. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this issue? Okay, there, Madam Chair. Yes. I, I think I recognize, are, are you Golden State Lumber? I work for Golden State. Okay, would you be willing to answer some questions? Because you don't have a slip no, for her. Could we? Sure, would you like to could you come up and address this please? Thank you. I just I noticed you, and we have no information on Golden State. So I, I'd like to know something about your operations because this is a concern to me: the proximity. And if no one talked to you, I think we need to hear 
what are you doing there? I mean, I drive down tunnel, I see the forklift going across, I see the lumber trucks coming and going, and I see the contractors pulling out. So given the hours that we've talked about, um, where they would be starting at four in the morning, and also until the evening hours. Could you tell us something about what your hours are and what the operation does? They is started, it? sorry, they started three o'clock in the morning. Who? Um, My oh, understanding George. is we, okay. um, we start receiving lumber at, at four. So from, let's say for about from four to 10 is our busy hours receiving big, the semi trucks, trucks of lumber. That's also when we stock the yard, people are coming um, on the west side of tunnel, we have all of our back stock, so they bring it. They use the morning time to bring over and stock the yard before we're open for customers. We open at 6 a.m. for customers. So our real busy time is from, I would say, 4 a.m. to 11. When you so, say, excuse me, when you say stock the yard, are you talking about the west side or the east side? Are you we're talking, talking about, about moving? The east side. So we, we store lumber over on the west side mm -hmm. and we bring it across and in the early morning hours when traffic is. Can you state uh, your name first? Oh, oh sorry. Tamara. 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 Okay. Yes. So um, we bring back stock over across the street to make sure everything's ready and stocked up when we open to the contractors at six. And then our time, so from four to 10 is the busy time of coming back and forth across the street and loading trucks. Trucks come down tunnel. Um, heading south and then they U-turn into the lot and they're they're staged there until they're ready to be directed across the street to um, get unloaded. Some of them get unloaded over on the west side and if it's stock but usually we store all of the lumber that comes in on the rail cars over on the, the west side. When you say trucks, you're talking trucks delivering to you? Yes. we're talking Not about. your trucks going out for deliveries? No. Our trucks first start going out for delivery around right around 6, sometimes 5.30. So our, the, our busy time crossing the street and unloading is from about 4 to 10, and then from 6 to 11 is customers coming in and out, okay. and our own delivery trucks. And, and if you utilize the railroad spur, when does that take place? That takes place, it's, it's random times. It generally comes in maybe around 9.30 or 10, but it, it's, they leave, they just come and get the car, at random times, I, I mean, it, there's, it really has no impact um, on us because it just sits there and it, they drop it off and we have 24 hours to unload it and then they come and pick it back up. Okay, so uh, my fellow commissioners have brought up a point maybe you can answer. We approved, the TransDev has been there now, I believe since 2009 and they've had renewal on their permit, but we also added the budget Avis behind them have you seen a difference in tunnel? Because the budget Avis was supposed to go non-peak hours. They wanted to go during peak hours and their permit approval was that they couldn't do that. I remember. Uh, I don't even, I don't see the budget Avis really mm -hmm. anymore. I, for a while it, it was really a cluster because they would send in big, um, but when you buy new cars and they go to the dealership, whatever those trucks are that haul all the cars, they had tons and they were just double parking and unloading mm -hmm. the cars in. I have, we haven't seen that in a while and I don't, I don't notice any rental car traffic coming in and out. So I, I don't even, I thought that they quit that operation really. I don't, I'm not sure if it's still even active. Okay, and how about the TransDev vehicles? Are you seeing them, do they come south? No, yeah, they're coming south. I never, very rarely do I ever see one come across. Uh, I have seen them come northbound, but they're generally coming from the southbound. You mean going towards you northbound? Yeah, sometimes they'll drive by the yard, like coming from the city of Brisbane. Maybe okay. they took Bayshore and they'll come up tunnel into there, but generally all of the ones that I've ever noticed, and I work in the office, so I'm not outside. So right, because they're not they supposed to be using that route either. Is they're always coming from this way right. when I leave. Okay. But I, I have seen them. There's no doubt. Okay. All right. Thank you very thank much. You. Sure. Okay. Anyone else who would like to speak? Okay, may I have a motion to close the public hearing? I move to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay.
Okay, let's have a discussion here. Um, first, uh, Ken. So Mr. Benson brought up that he's worked with other cities where they, I guess, set up some type of system where we can get their GPS information. Is that something that we could do? I don't, <clears throat> I would put it as a, I'd suggest that it be more of a condition of approval that upon request, I don't think staff is, is, I, I don't know. It, it seems a bit much to, to have staff looking at a continuous stream of, of trip data from Google. Well, no, I think because if he's saying it's easy for him to transmit the data to us, I don't know how, but if. I don't know how the staff would, would receive it. I don't know or what even kind e of systems are I don't, needed. Yeah, and, and yeah. I mean, I'm not sure, you know, we would have to, I guess, follow it up with them more how we would do it. But if somehow we just had the data and if there was a complaint or some issue or somebody was curious and wanted to check to make sure that the drivers were maintaining their routes, the least the information would be there. You know, I, I don't know, you know, how we could. It, you know, it seems to me that that could be a condition of approval that upon request they, well, they provide their if, data. If I may, I mean, I, I think, um, I'm sorry, um, your name again? Ross. Ross. Ross, it'd be pretty easy to just have someone on a monthly basis in a spreadsheet make a pivot table and identify how many trips have gone out on, you know, Beanie and, and followed that route, just having a very simple table, right? And that's something that's not that difficult to do. Could you go up again? Thanks. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I think we just have to look at it a little bit more to see if, how, how it all look. I think in a, like how you're describing it, it would be challenging because it would be a lot of data if you consider like every day and, and how, how do you define like where we're measuring it from because the, the GPS pings every five seconds. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine that's a lot of. Yeah, that's a lot of, that's a lot yes. of points. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, I would just suggest too, I mean, if there is a lot of like noise and, and feedback from residents, I think that's when we could do maybe a by request situation. And if that doesn't satisfy uh, or if, we, if you don't feel like you're getting satisfactory data or seeing what, if that's not aligning with what the feedback that you're receiving, then I think we, we would be more than willing to be as open as we need to be um, to share whatever information you, you guys need. But um, yeah, again, how, what it all looks like at the, you know at the end of the day, I think that that's just a, that w that would probably need a little bit more discussion. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out a way to provide like easily understandable feedback to the public to address the yeah. concerns that have been brought up about uh, how much time the buses are actually spending on, you know, Tunnel and Beatty yeah. and how many are moving on that route. Like, there's a way to do it, and we could talk offline about it. Yeah. I, just and what, I mean, a, a kind of a so relatively simple way to do it is, I mean, is we could do kind of spot checks. I mean, we would be more than willing to probably pay for a consultant to just right. go and sit at the, you know, at the gate and monitor the flow over like the course of a week. And we could do that several times over over a year or whatever kind of frequency that we agree on. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of like trip cap stuff that we do like with in that you know, similar fashion down in, in the South Bay. So I think that's kind of a kind of an old fashioned but kind of pretty reliable way to do these types of things. Okay. Um, well, so uh, again, I think we're willing to, to work with you and make sure that you all have and, and everyone has the the information to make everyone feel comfortable about it. Um, I think it, what the, you know, the nuts and bolts of it, I think, is just what we need to nail down. Okay. So thank you for all that explanation. I, I'm just trying to, in my mind, work through what, you know, I heard as a, a, a major concern. So thank you yeah. for sharing your, your concerns. I'm just, I'm just, you know, if we can make that somehow a condition of the, of the approval, Right, and, and I'm just trying to do it in a way that's less inconvenient to you, you know, just the simplest. Yeah, no, no, I get it. Yeah, I'm not trying to create this. this, right. this uh, a lot of data. Well, one comment I have is that in, in the world of data and, and regulation and litigation, I, my experience has been that it, it's a, it's a, uh, the traffic is heavier in one direction on this issue. Doing a data dump is easy for the people who maintain the data. 
sifting through a data dump is really hard. Yeah. And that's what, what Ken is saying, I think, between the lines. And, and it's way more time per bit and byte for them to interpret it than it is for you guys to go, boom, yeah. here's, all our, here's all our data. Um, so the devil's in the details of how we figure out how to get the data that we need to see that, that this permit, if granted, we're not imposing um, you know, real burdens on neighbors or residents or through traffic. Yeah. It's, I, I don't have the answer. I'm just believing the obvious that it's um, relatively easy for you guys, but, but hard for the recipients to figure out exactly what we need and how to, how to dig it out. Commissioner Patel, you had a comment? I was just going to say, it seems like a lot of data for Brisbane to shift through, sift through, which is what we were just talking about. But in terms of, in terms of, I mean, we're, if we make this proposed route mapping a part of the condition and there is a complaint, then they can verify whether or not there was a violation, it seems like, and they can provide the GPS locations for each of their buses at that time. So we would be able to confirm whether or not there was a violation. Assuming there was a violation, Ken, what would happen? If there was a violation, the first course of action is to to get in touch with the operator and and um, give them an uh, opportunity to correct that if they fail to do that in a reasonable time. Then they could always come back to the planning commission for a revocation procedure. So how many violations, how many complaints would it take for you guys to come back to the planning commission? I don't have a, I, th I think we would look at what's reasonable based on uh, case by case, what's what's going on. I, I, I don't want to play <laughs> hypotheticals. Yeah, I mean, we have a process, we, I, I think you can, you know, if there are, if there are complaints that are verified as re real, legitimate complaints, then we would follow up and, and take action. And that ultimately could come to the Planning Commission. But for me to off the top of my head come up with scenarios on what... Well, it just seems, I'm sorry, it just seems ambiguous like we would give them an opportunity to correct action. So let's say there's like five violations. Is that, how many, how many opportunities do we give people to to sort of conform to the permit. So what what specific violation are you talking about? So let's say there's a, what we're gonna say is part of the condition that they have to follow this proposed route mapping. Then there's three times where people have said, you know what, we've seen them south, we've seen them south of um, where they're parking their cars. Is that a violation that would come then to the Planning Commission? See, I, I understand what so you're saying. Like, it's you got, you're saying that you would give them opportunities to sort of fix the problem, but for someone in the community, it's like, well, how many how many opportunities are we going to give them to fix? I them? don't I don't have an answer for you. Okay. I, this would be subject to first uh, the planning director to you know we would look at at what the case is, what specifically is going on, and and uh, notify them. I, I seriously have my doubts that they would want to put their use permit in jeopardy by continuing to operate in a, in a, um, a manner that's outside the permit. Um, but if, if you want to, if you have some language that you want to craft into a, into a condition of approval, I, I put that back to the commission. Can I ask Ross to come back up for one second? Was it, I have an idea. Um, would it be feasible, whenever you com you know you complete this flight and you're up and running, call that day zero, <coughs> by day, you know ninety or something, to to come back to to the planning department with you guys having sorted through your data rather than us having had to do it, and give us um, not just violations of. of the traffic route that's that's a no-brainer that's easy but more um a little bit a little bit deeper dig into what the what's the word traffic engineers i'm sure have a word for this what the clustering is yeah. when yeah. the traffic Flow is, is and, yeah. you know when you are affecting traffic the most on tunnel avenue by how much yeah. it would be helpful that we can revisit that and look at the impact of that and and consider um 
modifying the conditions in some way. I, I you have a use p permit before you tonight to to take some kind of action on, but right. once whether it's approval, denial, continuance, wh whatever that action is, but to impose a requirement that he, that the applicant return to the commission at a future date um, to, I, I, I'm not, my, my head is having a hard time wrapping around how we legally do that as a city. And I'm trying to figure out a way for this commission to, to keep its thumb on it to see if, if the effect is more adverse than we currently so to think it's going to be. So and again, I, this, this was reviewed by, by the city's traffic consultant. It did not move the needle in terms of any kind of significance. Um, it's outside the, the peak hours that in the morning, especially, um, through the afternoon and the evening, it's more spread out. Um, granted, it is in peak hours, but it's more spread out in those hours. I, so I, I guess if you have a condition of approval for, I, I'd suggest something that was more along the lines of um, based on complaint that the applicant provide um, their trip data to the city in a, in a form acceptable to the community development director so that we're not sifting through reams of data that it's summarized in some form that's acceptable to us but that it, I would suggest that it be based on on complaints do we have <coughs> uh, Ken do we have any precedent of doing anything like that because it's really no. difficult for me to say well if we get three complaints then Google needs to give us a traffic flow report at the next city council meeting or whatever you know so I'm just trying to figure out what that number is so if, if we had complaints staff would actually verify we don't just take complaints at face value we we need to do staff verification that yes in fact this is happening okay and then we reach out to the the operator and and seek to correct that usually within a very short period of time and and check that if it's not happening then we take further course of action All right. Commissioner Mack can have something thank you okay I'm gonna go in a little different direction here Baylands are very large open area why not park a bunch of cars there well we've already done that from 4 to 8 a.m., we have 62 transdev shuttles that go north. We have 750 Avis budget cars that are parked there and travel through the whole course of the day. And then we would have in the morning from 4 to 6, 60 Google buses and 60 employee cars, not to mention the transdev employee cars that also come in. I just, I, I am, I'm astonished. And, and then we go in the afternoon from 4 to 6, 6.30, which is heavy traffic on Bayshore Tunnel, the whole area. We have 40 to 50 Google buses and 40 Google cars, not to mention TransDev employees, TransDev vans, not to mention Recology trucks. We have an unimproved interchange up there, and granted, Beatty is, is not the most egregious. The worst part is the on-ramps. But here's a concern I have. Is it Heath, Miss Heath? Okay, Tamara Heath. She manages, I know the name, she manages the Golden State. Um, she mentioned transdev shuttles coming south. They're not supposed to go south. They're only supposed to go on the same northern route on tunnel. That's what they said in the permit. We're sitting here spending all this time trying to talk about, well, what happens if they don't follow? And we already know sometimes they're not following. 
what I find more remarkable here is we have a business on tunnel that's 220 feet away that has enormous cross traffic. I travel tunnel more than I ever get on the highway or go north. That's how I go. Just been 20 years of going north. I'm seeing Uber lift cars that don't want to go on the highway. So they're going 45 to 50. They about run me over. Okay. Lots more vehicles going north south and forklifts going across the road. And we're going to have in the dark, in the dark, I want to remind you, in the morning for several hours and in the afternoon, remember, we're going to get dark early again. But in the morning, we're going to have 60 buses turning left onto tunnel 220 feet away from where Golden State Lumber is moving lumber across tunnel. Does anyone see a problem here? No. I just think the site is not the right place. If they were all north, if you had Transdev, you got the Avis people, they're all north, they want to go north, they're supposed to go north and not travel south. But to go cut to the left and make that turn, which is also across any southbound traffic, little there may be, while they're doing all that lumber operation, I just think that's lunacy. I'm sorry. I just don't get it. Well, I think before, because I get out early. I'm, I'm on that road 4 or 5 a.m. all the time. No one is on there. So the question is really the 6 to 7 a.m. time frame for me. 6 to 10. The si no, the 6 to 7 in the morning, okay. right? Because that's, that's what we're talking about. No, but they're moving the lumber 4 right. o'clock. Um, so that's, I can't speak for the lumber. I can't speak for Golden State Lumber. Right. So, so all I'm saying, and this is just my, this is my experience on the road. You mm -hmm. know, I could be totally wrong. Right? In my opinion, my experience, I don't see that level of volume. I see the volume after 7.30, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. That's when there's a lot of movement, a lot of bikes, a lot of people, a lot of trucks, gas trucks, ton of movement on that road. I've never been stuck on that road. Mm -hmm. I've always gotten through it. But there's more movement. So I, I hear you loud and clear. Um, I, 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 just, I, I think that the hours for me, the 3 to 7 time frame for me, is, is missing the big chunk of activity on that road. So what staff is saying is that there was a traffic analysis done on this particular project as well as an environmental analysis. I don't think any of us have seen it, have we? No. Well, what I, I didn't hear was any... any so analysis unique to this application. It was, it was run by the traffic engineer and no adverse comments were made. Is that yes, through the chair. So the traffic study was in 2017, which took into account um, the uses such as Golden State Lumber, Transdev, of course, was operating then. It also took into account the Avis fleet. It wasn't <coughs> operating yet, but they were aware of it and calculated that into their model. Um, we ran this back to them, and they didn't run a whole new study. That was not, the city did not pay for a whole new study on, on this. Essentially, the response back was, there are not enough vehicle trips generated by this to be of significance. And it would not, this, the level that we're talking about would not change the the level of service on any of the intersections that are that would be affected by the use. So it wasn't a full traffic study at this point in time, but it was looked at um, relative to the traffic study. So was the environmental study done, the new environmental study with the grading and how that would affect the wetlands? So the the use is considered categorically exempt. We did not do, for instance, a, an EIR or, or that. It, it was outside the wetlands area, which, which um, is something that, that we were looking at to make sure that it was outside, that we didn't need to look at, at those impacts and that there was a sufficient buff, buffer that we, we looked at with the, with the um, the Baylands uh, environmental consultant. So those were looked at, but it, it did not trigger 
larger environmental study work to be done. Any more questions for staff? Any more discussions you want to have here? I, I just think that a traffic study does not address the problem that you're creating for Golden State. They've been a business in Brisbane. They're there. You're, you're going to make them adapt to this. And I think it's very dangerous. I don't think you're thinking this through. But they were noticed. They was, Bailen, was, Golden, was Golden State Lumber noticed? Yes. So they were sent a letter they, saying? They would have been, they would have been within the, well, I'm pretty sure, actually. I, I'd have to look back at my list. We did send out the standard notice. It goes to 300 feet radius owners. There is a gap between the two sites, so. Uh, 220 feet is what your staff report says. Okay. So then they were noticed? Yes, they're within the footprint of the notice. I, I just think you're failing to realize you're not just talking 90 Google buses. You're talking all the employee cars within 220 feet of their entrance with all this cross traffic. Have you ever been there when they're pulling out with lumber trucks and the contractors are loaded with lumber? And then we're talking the hours. And granted, in the afternoon peak, some of these hours when they're open are going to be in the dark. I just, I just. The. Sorry, I think it's a bad idea. The um, environmental study that was, that you reviewed, is that a public document? Or Are, uh, what in which environmental study? So you said that this was done in consultant consultation with. The so this was the applicants. This was run through the city's environmental consultant on the Baylands project as a whole. Okay. And there is a, a traffic study that was done in 2017 that's, that's available if, if um, somebody wanted to view that. The environmental study that was provided to the city, that's a public document? That can be reviewed. What environmental study? So there was no study done. There was just an uh, there was an uh, there was a it's consultation. It's a cate categorical exempt. Okay. So there's not an environmental study document that was prepared for this project S as a categorical exemption. So there is no there's absolutely zero concern of any runoff or any effect on the watershed. Correct. Okay. And the traffic study was from 2017. And Golden State Lumber technically should have been noticed. We don't know for sure, but they're within the 300. They were noticed. They're, they're on the map, and I have a list of their, I, I believe the ownership is actually SFPP. Which would be within the radius of, of the map area. OK. Anybody else have any con other concerns they'd like to address? Uh, may I comment? add one thing? Sure. We're talking a five-year permit. Uh -huh. So when you're talking about, well, if it doesn't work, someone will complain. I've had several things. I drove down tunnel, and I never called to complain. I've seen the Avis budget cars just caravanning seen them going the wrong way, I didn't call and complain. I'm a planning commissioner and I didn't complain. Are we really going to rely on complaints? Well, I've asked that question before and right. the categorical answer is we're a complaint-based city, so that's how everything works here. So unless someone complains, then there's no enforcement. Yeah, I mean, we complain about traffic every day. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I guess the answer to that is yes. It has to be complaint-based is what I've been told like over and over and over again. 
Well, okay, so your, your main concern is about safety. It, and, it's and not just safety, it's also their business. I think, I think that this is going to hurt their business. They've been in Brisbane. You're adding a new use that is, there's no way this is not going to affect them. If they were in Honestly. Citizen, and they should be here. If, if that's I, really even I, I feel a responsibility. It's my due diligence to not approve something that could create a hazard where someone could get hurt. That's not their job. That's my I, job. I think the road, I mean, okay, if we want to just talk safety, that road is unsafe right now. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. Like, it's unsafe having, you know, just the tanks there. Agreed. Remove the lumber yard. And you've got tanker everything trucks. Else. Remove the commuter right. traffic, remove everything. Right. Just the tanks itself. Just having those big, yep. you know, Holland diesel and Holland refined petroleum on there every single day, it's unsafe. I, you know, and for actually the first five years that I was in town here, I biked that road pretty much every single day and <laughs> would have those big trucks ripping right yep. past me. You know, so. I and you're going to add more cars to that yeah, going yeah, down I that road with yeah, those tanker I think it's trucks. Part of the risk. Well. The way I look at it is those buses are going to roll regardless, whether they roll out of the Genentech yard or the South City yard. They're shepherding Google employees north south. My personal opinion mm -hmm. that's a public benefit to actually remove all those cars off the road. Are we increasing safety risk on Tunnel Avenue? That's the concern. Tunnel. Potentially. Mm -hmm. So make Potentially. how about how about how about but this? Why don't you just decrease the why don't you just decrease the time frame of the permit so you can have a, a reapplication to see if there's any issues on it. So instead of making it five years, make it a year or make it two years, make but, it whatever it is. But economically to make it feasible for them to do those improvements for a one year permit is really not But then I mean sense. then they'll come if they're not complying. it's only if they're not complying, right? Otherwise they're gonna get a renewal. Well, they'd have to come back for a renewal. Right, exactly. That's exactly the point, right? So you're putting a bunch of conditions on it, saying like they're not if they don't if they are not following the routes. If there are if there is a significant impact of Golden State, then you don't renew it in a year. Well, I'd like the applicant to speak on that. So if we were to reduce the use permit time, um, would that be a burden on you? That is a challenge, I, I, and the, the reason I think, in because there's, I guess the thing is, how are we going to validate what, or what, what's the criteria for renewal, and if there's, if there's some way we can, if that's like a data-driven process versus just, you know, I mean, feedback is important, and, and the, the feed, like responding to feedback, I, oftentimes that's a good way to get things done, but, you know, one of the problems that we often run into in the Bay Area is that, you know, every bus is a is a Google bus. And with other bus operators on the site, how are we going to differentiate what is a Google, Google bus, what is you know another bus? And if we're basing it off of feedback, I think that just becomes a little bit challenging. Because if you guys hear, if we come back in a year and you're like, oh, you know, all we've heard for the last at these me at, at our meetings was that you know the bus traffic, is that I mean, is that because somebody just doesn't like the concept, or is that or is it a real problem? And I think that's what we would. That, that would be the challenge that we would face. Well, one, one of the upsides of, of Commissioner Patel's idea is that if you come back in a year or two years, whatever the magic amount is, you would have your actual data. You could tell us, we you know, I don't, we don't know whose buses those are they're complaining about, but we only have five in this hour, 10 in this hour, yeah. 20 in that hour, and they can't possibly be piling up like that. Um, and it gives, you, gives us a chance to, to sort of cross-validate both sure. your data and the complaints. Not a, not, I don't a, not a bad idea to me. I don't know if any other large bus is operating. It would only be yours. So when well, you say you mentioned MV has an operation close by. I mean, those are our transdev. I mean, those are buses, right? They're they're no, they're using small vans. They're Ford vans, and now they're gasoline powered. Okay, yeah. Right. <coughs> um, to Commissioner Mackin's point about uh, the cost of the improvements, uh, to only get one year of use. Um, you know, the, the first year is not where we would offset the cost. Uh, that would come further down the road. So the longer the permit uh, or the use is active, the better uh, the economics are for us, obviously. Um, so it, it's definitely not the first year where we start to see, you know, a benefit financially to this use. Um, so if we were to, you know, spend the money up front uh, making the improvements, uh, we'd much rather prefer to see the use um, kept 
for a period of time such as five years, longer than one, definitely. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we've talked this to death, so. Uh, <laughs> well, I would, did you want to say something else? I, my, it's a tough one because we really aren't sure what's gonna happen and maybe there's no way to be sure what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the, you know, the one public comment we've had expressed some, some legitimate uh, and, and sincere concerns um, that, that um, the planning department, the staff's um, resources um, didn't seem to, to consider of the same, the same uh, strength or the same concern. Um, I think we definitely need to make the, the traffic pattern compliance a condition regardless of whatever else we do. So let's make this, why don't we just make that motion first then? Well, I think we have to, I think we have to, we can, but it'd be nicer to package the whole deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, think. I, I would say, you know, if there is a, if it seems as though there's a huge concern about Golden State, um, Golden State Lumber, the traffic on that street, compliance with the route, then why don't we pick a term that's shorter than five years? For them to come for a renewal, would it would it help Commissioner Mackin's concerns if you reached out explicitly to Golden State and say, "Hey, have you really seen this? Have you thought about this? And do you have a concern, or, or has this just gotten thrown behind, behind the radiator and they didn't show up, or do they really I, not care?" I can't speak for them, Doug. I know, I know. But would it help if we if we asked them to? But then we're get, so you're suggesting. Well, but you've got some. Yeah. Yeah. So. So yeah, he, are I'm you suggesting continuing it, having staff specifically call Golden State to see if they want to come and represent themselves? Is that what you're asking? I mean, I recognize that doesn't address Commissioner Mackin's concern that you know our job is to is to independently uh, look to to safety and traffic issues. I get that, but if if Golden State is the biggest issue, uh, maybe give them a chance to speak. Technically, they had their chance. They, they got notice. I get that. But uh. didn't we have our police department weigh in on the safety issue? Then? Yes, they received it as well. And no, no comments, no concerns. And uh, were there any concerns about traffic on Tunnel Avenue from the police department perspective? Because that is one thing I have seen. I will say, more frequently, I do see Brisbane police on on tunnels. That has been, I have noticed that over the last several years. I've seen more of a presence. And I travel during different hours, so. No, there were no comments from police on the traffic. Okay. Well, I'm open to someone entertaining a motion to approve with some of the conditions we discussed and see where we are with that. Um, for example, um, making sure they comply with the stated route. So that would be in there. Um, I've heard shortening the use permit time to perhaps two years or we keep it at five. I don't know how folks feel about that. So that would be one other thing. Um, so those who are leaning towards approval, what do you think of the conditions? Commissioner Mackin, would decreasing the amount of time to reassess any impact, if any at all, would that alleviate any of your concerns? I, I'm not sure if I understand what you're suggesting. So if you make it a two-year permit instead of a five in two years, you would have data, actual data to see if Golden State Lumber was impacted, whether there was significant deviation from the route, whether there was any impact on bicycle safety versus having to do it in five years. I, I just think we're operating on a 2017 traffic study. Right. Cumulative background traffic, which overflows onto surface streets, and we're creating a hazard for an existing business. So why do I want to wait for two years to find out if it caused them a problem for two years? That's, that's the concern I have. I, I don't think that this was thought through. I, I think when you have a big, vast swath of property like UPC has on the Baylands. I understand trying to maximize uses. I get it. I totally get it. 
I understand the benefit of Google buses versus single cars, although we're going to bring a bunch of single cars in here too with employees. But I don't think this was thought through. The proximity to a retail business that operates in some of these hours are going to be in the dark with a lot of cross traffic and these buses are turning across them. I just think it's a terrible idea. Okay, we have to make a decision. So does anyone want to make a motion? I'm trying to gauge the, the the mood of the room to try to find something that that can at least get most of us to agree. And I I, I get I'm sensitive to the concerns of, of the public about this, but I'm also looking at the fact that people with actual historical data and and staff and their consultants um, didn't feel that this moved the needle substantially. That said, we don't know for sure what's going to happen. My my highest comfort level is to shorten the, the terms of the permit, make the traffic pattern a condition of the permit, and also make reapplication for the permit conditioned on providing their data. And I think we need to tweak what that's going to look like, but their data of traffic flow um, during the, the term of the permit when the traffic actually was and how much and how many and during what, you know, break it down to tighter, tighter time parameters, this, this many during this period. Uh, I think we can get some language about that eventually. I can't, I can't do it off the, off the cuff, but I, so that's my motion. I'm, I move to approve <coughs> the permit with a condition of traffic routing being uh, a condition of the permit and that reapplication um, must be accompanied by traffic flow data from the applicant so the com commission can gauge the impact over the, that time of, of the buses. And you're making it a two-year permit? Yeah. Yes. Do I have a second? A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. The application for a use permit of two years is approved with the condition stated. And if you can state the appeals process for oh, the yes. applicant while they're here. As, as to both um, applicants. So I'll read the appeals process. Anyone may appeal the action of the Planning Commission to the City Council. Appeal shall be filed with the City Clerk within six calendar days of the Planning Commission's actions for use permit applications. An application form and fee is required to make a formal appeal. Thank you. Next, we have a study session concerning storefront retail cannabis regulations. Staff, may we have that presentation? Yes, thank you, Chairperson. So tonight we're having our second study session or workshop on our um, pending store storefront retail cannabis regulations. So tonight we're going to review the City Council direction just to refresh your memories of what we've been tasked to do in these zoning text amendments. We'll review the last workshop you guys held on July 25th. Um, we'll also give you an overview of the state permitting, license permitting procedures um, based on a prior request by the Commission and to kind of set up our discussion of the local permitting process options we have. Um, and then we'll ask you guys to kind of wrap up, maybe hopefully get to some consensus and give us some direction as we move forward with an actual ordinance. Uh, so again, in June of this year, the City Council initiated a zoning text amendment um, to regulate storefront uh, retail cannabis businesses. Um, the limits that the Council set were to have no more than four businesses operating in the city and that they be conditionally permitted uses in all the zoning districts that currently allow retail sales, which are listed there on your slide. Um, so that would be more than the current TC1 district where we have our other cannabis businesses um, allowed to operate by use permit. So uh, a couple months ago in July, we had our first workshop on this subject. Um, and the meat of that workshop was to focus on the 
per permitting process. And we had provided you guys with a lot of data from other cities, uh, small to medium-sized cities in California um, that regulate storefront retail and kind of broke down the different options for approval processes, um, one being a two-tiered process where there's first a license uh, for the actual business itself, uh, followed by a land use approval, a use permit uh, for their specific operations at a location uh, versus a, a one-tier or one-permit uh, process like a use permit um, or even just a license. Uh, we also talked about different uh, the business cap regulations, uh, permit and license renewals, application fees, and kind of the whole um, uh, spectrum of regulations. And at that point, uh, at the end of that workshop, you all voiced a consensus to move forward to explore a two-tiered process um, with, where first a license and then a use permit would be um, required with uh, using a scoring or ranking system for the license as well as requiring annual license uh, renewal. Um, so to kind of set up and review um, the current state licensing regulations, so the at the state level, the licensing body for most licenses is the Bureau of Cannabis Control. Um, the Department of Public Health manages um, a couple licenses, but it's mostly the BCC. Um, there are six license types at the state level, uh, retail, manufacturing, distributor, uh, testing lab, cultivation, and then micro business. Uh, you'll probably recall we've already issued use permits for, um, we've banned cultivation in Brisbane, uh, but we've issued use permits already for almost all of the uh, uses we permit here, uh, and for retail, only non-storefront, of course. Um, the state regulations require that prior to a business getting a license, they show proof of local authorization. So here in Brisbane, um, for example, for existing cannabis businesses, that local authorization is the use permit approval um, with the exception of testing labs in the Sierra Point area, which do not require use permit. That's just a business license. So the business license approval is our local authorization in that case. Right now, um, this may have changed recently, but at least at the beginning of this year, um, there was quite a lengthy time between a business submitting its application to the state and getting an approval. Um, we were getting uh, notified of like six months of processing time um, at the most. So perhaps as the state's gotten the ball rolling more, that, that time has reduced recently, but at least in, in this year, it has been fairly lengthy for applicants and that's after they've gone through our process. Um, so at this point, I'd like to ask Commander Mario Garcia uh, from PD to walk you through at a broad level the, um, what applicants have to provide to the state in terms of security and background checks. So Mario, would you? Good evening, Madam Chairman and members of the commission. My name is Commander Mario Garcia. What I'd like to do tonight is give you a brief of background on how the security measures in regards to retail cannabis facilities are developed and implemented. As you can see on the slide in front of you, on, uh, projected up on the screen, is a list of sex sub subsections from the California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Division 42, and Bureau of Cannabis Control. In the past, the product of a retail cannabis store is always seen from a security standpoint that it may have originated from the city. And what I'm about, what I, what I, I'd, like, I'd like to go through is that the actual control over the implementation of security measures actually really it, are inceptions from the state processing center, uh, state, uh, what do you call it, Bureau of Cannabis Control. The, sub the subsections I've listed for you pertain to security measures, as you can see, that the license of Bureau of Cannabis Control have several features that must be implemented. I believe what the hand, a hand that I would have gave to you is more of an expanded view of what each subsection requires. Um, the actual um, Title 16 is 138 pages. Within the 138 pages, this is not include the subsections, what you see is not inclusive of all the subsections of the permitting process or the license process. I basically have stripped away just the security features of a retail cannabis store and I basically listed them in front of you. Um, in the language of the details that I've given you, I basically also have taken away the redundancy and the legal terms and 
really has brought it down to what we look for in regards to enforcement if we were to do a spot check on the businesses. Um, as, as you see, the Bureau of Cannabis Control has done every aspect in regards to looking over the business model and operations of a retail cannabis store, and they've addressed everything from age restrictions, locks, operations, record retention, and all the way down to details such as surveillance to frames per second on the CCTVs. What they have done is, as far as like security personnel you see in subsection 5045, they state that there is a security, that security should be present during business hours, but they don't tell you how that looks looks like. Um, that is up to the, us as a, as a governing board of the city, how we may want that to look like. And as we get into the later uh, presentation, we can show it how we refine those subsections and made them enhancements to our use permit. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those questions at this point for those. I'll hand it back to Julia. Thank you. Yeah, apologies. I should have noted that handout was on the dais for you. Um, can I ask a quick question? Um, having taken a tour of a couple of places recently, um, there were lots of, of – uh, fair number of cameras and that kind of surveillance. And, and is there any specific number of cameras or how you – how do you judge whether they have enough surveillance? So in the subsection for the security cameras, they actually spell out in detail that every location where a uh, product is handled, stored, um, prepared, unloaded, and loaded has to have security cameras within them. Um, in, even in regards to point of sale, uh, transactions where there's a point of sale has to be within cameras. Um, ingress and egress, 20 feet of the door of each door has to have a security camera. Um, all locked doors should have security cameras. So they actually, it, their subsection, their stipulation for, for security cameras and closed circuit TV actually will expand depending on how large the facility would get and what they add into it. So it's pretty inclusive and pretty detailed on, hey, it's got to have security, I mean, footage in this area. And lastly, and I'll I found the subsection where my own questions were answered. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll keep it short. Um, it says that the BCC gets access to the to the viewing upon request. Does the Brisbane PD also get access? Correct. So in the later part of this presentation, it, part of our enhancements will actually double. I mean, it, it's kind of redundant, and we're restating it, but we're actually restating it with language to where CCTV would be um, available to us upon 24 hours by the, either the police chief or designee. Okay. So we actually cover it again only because when the Bureau of Counties called made their stipulations, they made it for them, but they also know that we're going to dovetail off of that. Okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. So that's just a quick and dirty on the state permitting process. So I um, just wanted to kind of emphasize the, I don't want to say hoops, but the very rigorous process that applicants go through um, in order to get their state license. It's very premise specific or, you know, the way the floor plan is designed and the way that the business operations are designed, that's all taken into account at the BCC review level. Um, I won't go over or belabor our existing use permit process. You guys are very familiar with it. Let's kind of jump into our um, more in-depth discussion of the options we have as a local jurisdiction to um, permit and regulate storefront retail businesses. So again, we heard from you guys at the July 25th meeting. We had kind of given you a high-level overview of options, and you guys had indicated a preference at that time. Um, in the meantime, uh, planning staff and PD have collaborated on, um, you know, based on your input, what that kind of licensing procedure of a separate license followed by a use permit would actually look like, how we would implement it as staff. Um, we also were considering um, the fact that we have a cap of four businesses from the council, how we would kind of modulate that with, well, how do we control the license application process, which happens first? Are we limiting that to four as well, or are we going to do, you know, we had talked about all the different options of there's a lottery, there's all these rankings. Um, so based on our staff discussions, we identified 
just some issues or, or considerations that we wanted to um, talk about in more detail with you all before we moved too much farther. Um, so one is, you know, using the ranking and scoring criteria. That's kind of assuming that we're going to open up our license process to any business that wants to do business here. Um, that's that's what those processes look like in other cities. Sorry, in other cities that have employed those ranking processes, it's because they've kind of said, okay, we're going to accept from any business that wants to do business here an application, and then we're going to do this very rigorous scoring and and the top, you know, cream of the crop will come out. Um, and that's only earning them a right to then apply for a use permit in town. Um, there's a couple things that for us came up with that as staff. You know, one, something we've already talked about with you all, we have very limited inventory here in town. Inventory, I mean leasable inventory for these businesses. I think you guys talked about that last time as well. Um, the, the thought that we might have a lot of interest from businesses, but then not a lot of realistically leasable space for those interested businesses really struck us as a disconnect. Do we really want to kind of open the floodgates when there's only maybe four spots or you know a few handful of spaces that are actually going to be leased by these businesses? Um, so that was just something that kind of struck us as uh, whether or not that's really appropriate for us here. Um, and then looking at rating system, oh, go on. If I don't ask this question, I'll forget it. When you say if you if you move to a ranking system that's going to apply to all business, are you saying that if we if you move to a ranking system for permit applications, it would have to apply to frozen yogurt and bike stands as well, no. or just just cannabis? Yeah, sorry. So the direction that you all seem to agree on uh, July 25th was we would like a two-tiered process with a license where people apply for a license and those applications are ranked <coughs> and scored in some way to generate a top four or whatever, followed by they then have to apply for a use permit. So that's what the, I'm talking about here, that just in terms of limited leasable area, I'm thinking cannabis specifically um, due to the concerns that a lot of industrial property owners have with leasing to cannabis businesses specifically um, because they're still federally illegal because it's a cash business because of all the things we've kind of talked about before. So what was the consensus as to <coughs> the opening it up for licensing when there's only like four possible locations? Like what was, well, what was the Well, as I recall, consensus? there was perhaps some dissenting opinion on that, but th the, the conclusion when we kind of were closing up that workshop of testing you all, um, the consensus was that we heard as staff and what was reflected on the tape um, was two-tiered process with a ranking uh, a procedure for the licenses. No, but then w you just said that you guys talked about it more and that there was like this disconnect because there's only a few limited ret the retail areas or locations versus we're opening up licensing to everyone. Was there sort of like a, like a solution to that <laughs> or like a... I think at the end of my oh, sorry, okay. list of considerations, perhaps the solution will reveal itself, or at least what we think of as a solution. Okay. Um, okay, so so again, we had concerns with the implementation of that. Um, also looking at how other cities have employed these ranking or rating systems, um, they're often really complex, and some of them have like hundreds of points that are possible, so you are in situations where perhaps one business is edged out by like two points um, and, and just misses the cutoff. Like uh, I think we told you guys last time there was a threat of le legal action in Pasadena and that since has now manifested in a lawsuit I think last month um, by a business that feels it was not graded or ranked fairly. Um, so we have concerns with that obviously of, of if we're going to be implementing this ranking and point system those are all implementation issues to think about. Look, may, may I? Because I just kind of had a stream of memory from from all we were talking about, you know, commerce discrimination, right? And like, how do we how do we balance that? And are we going to open? Like, we were discussing like because Commissioner Patel, you weren't were you not here? Is that? No, what? I, I was here. Was here. Were, okay. I was here, and I was just concerned that there we were limiting it to four people, like to four. Well, right. We were talking about that, right? And 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 so, I don't think the f the, the the one fact. 
part of the fact pattern that we did not have is this limited amount of leasable space. I hear you correctly, right? There's not a lot of open retail. I, I think we talked about that in July. Okay, um, that, that in the didn't stick in of, my head, I guess, so yeah. I apologize. I don't have like a list of available leases. Yeah, no, I'm I, more I, thinking of like the issues we've kind of raised before of, again, there are not a lot of property owners are interested in leasing to right. these businesses, right. Right. And which we limits inventory. Right, which is, we Especially were talking right about that would limit well. the number anyways. So you've got a you've got a discriminatory element there just due to the fact in the, the complexity be between federal and state law, right? So that's mm -hmm. functioning in the marketplace. For me, I, I kind of stand by let the competition happen and the good businesses will rise to the top. Yep. That's, that's my general. My understanding is that's not on the table because it's but limited to four businesses. Exactly, right. right. But we're not, yeah. So. Well, the, I think, yes, that is what a ranking process does in theory because the businesses, the best businesses are being judged on all these various criteria and they rise to the top. But well, that my becomes, point from a yeah. implementation standpoint, again, is okay, that's well a good way to do that, but then how do you actually craft the criteria? How is the point system distributed? And again, the concerns are, are we going to get in a situation where an right. applicant may, may, you know, so we're just, again, raising concerns for you all to think about in implementation. Um, is it okay if I just... Sorry, if I... Yeah, I didn't this. mean to I cut you off or derail you there. Insane, I just... So. No, it's just, okay. I was trying to, yeah, stimulate some more conversation. It's okay. Um, I know it was three months ago now, too, so that doesn't help. Um, uh, the other thing that we were thinking about um, in this whole two-tiered thing uh, proposal is, you know, the fact that basically separate departments would be screening applications. So in a licensing process, typically, again, what other cities are doing, um, you know, we have our local example, Pacifica and San Mateo County, the license uh, process is managed by the police department. It's, it's really looking at, you know, kind of background checks, security, um, kind of vetting from a public health, uh, public health and safety standpoint. Um, in other cities, there were subcommittees appointed of people from whether it's the community or city staff or consultants. Um, so we're just kind of thinking of the screening that's happening um, being separate from the land use approval can at times lead to some disconnects um, in terms of what criteria is being looked at for the first round versus the criteria that you all look at in use permit approval. Um, and there's a concern that could perhaps someone pass muster for a license but then somehow not for a land use permit. Um, do we really want people to go through a license application who then for whatever reason are incapable of pulling a use permit? Um, that's kind of the disconnect issue for, for staff that we see in implementation. Um, and then again, there's kind of some overlap and redundancy we were seeing in the license process that we were thinking about crafting. Um, specifically, again, for background checks and security, um, assuming that we are kind of using a Pacifica model with the findings for use permit. So are we, by separating out the two processes, are we kind of just, you know, how redundant are our findings necessarily for approving the license versus approving a use permit? Um, we're also thinking about, you know, extending the time between someone's initial application as a business here um, all the way to getting their land use approval and then going through the state process as well. I mean, that for some businesses, you're looking at potentially a year and a half to two years. Um, and then again, in this competition uh, kind of ranking idea, um, just kind of pointing out also that that might position uh, more industrial or larger businesses to uh, have an advantage over smaller businesses that may be just as viable or beneficial to the community, but perhaps don't have the maybe financial ability or other ability to provide community services or kind of some of the extras that um, some of the bigger uh, fish are able to provide. So again, this is just things I don't think we really talked about in depth back in July that we wanted to highlight, um, both from planning staff and PD. Um, so something we wanted to put forward to you all tonight was to consider whether whether we can enhance or modify our existing use permit process that we have um, for 
storefront retail businesses. Um, so, you know, for example, creating additional special findings for a use permit that really speak to the specifics um, that, that we're actually concerned about as a community and as a city for storefront retail. Um, we, there's a couple things, I mean, in terms of allowing for more cohesive collaboration between planning staff and police, I think can only be beneficial. We're a very small city. Um, we naturally work together. So right now on use permit processes, um, while police reviews a certain segment of the application formally, um, we're always collaborating with each other and working with the applicants more of as a team. Um, so to, to introduce a kind of separate uh, licensing procedure didn't seem very natural to us. Um, so there's a list of reasons I think that are kind of the mirror opposites of the considerations that I just walked through um, that we think basically we could accomplish um, all of the, the, the kind of merit-based review of applications um, with an enhanced use permit process rather than separating out into to two tiers. Um, and Mario was gonna also go over security enhancements that we've thought through for uh, storefront retail. So as you've seen in the, in the first slide that we presented, um, a lot of the security features that we see at the end product when we ta have taken tours in um, conferences that we've gone to. Um, I've gone to several conferences um, all the way to the inception of, you know, for three or four years ago to Colorado, um, seeing their model and Colorado was a, was a great state of actually inviting government and saying this is what we did, this is what we failed, and this is what you got to see. So I've been to three of those conferences in Colorado. I've gone to several California conferences and a lot of it is, on the output, it looks very security heavy in terms of granting their use permit in terms of local you know, operation. But in actuality, you know, the Bureau of Cannabis Control actually always sets that already in place. They come to us with all that, that, those in place. So we don't, as much as we, we don't like to make redundancy, we do want to add certain things like, as you see up here, storefront entry control. Um, in Brisbane, there has been mention of, you know, having areas where they necessarily don't want to see a security officer outside of a business. So what we can do is we do a storefront en entry control where we have a interior lobby control. Um, more of a lobby. I mean, not the thing you have to be, uh, somebody says, welcome somebody, they check the ID, and it actually takes place outside of the scene of, you know, on the sidewalk. And then there's areas that are also within the zoning that, you know, outside security would be beneficial because of it's not heavy foot traffic, um, more prone to vehicle drive-bys. So we, you know, people look in and, you know, kind of scout in the area. So we'd want that security officer to be outside to kind of deter, hey, we have security on site. If you're thinking about doing anything, loitering, kind of, you know, bothering people, get going. Um, uh, window coverings, we, we can address window coverings in terms of we don't want to make it a, you know, kind of a dusk place where, you know, the, the mood is, you know, not friendly. So we've addressed that. We've addressed loitering. Um, loitering in terms of, you know, making the business owners or the personnel call the police the minute some, something's out there or removing obstacles out there that maybe a park bench or, or, or a bench that, you know, people start loitering on. Um, same with the nuisance, man, nu nuisance management in regards to, you know, just again calling, calling us and addressing issues that become a nuisance. Um, in terms of the criminal background, I'm gonna skip to the criminal background part of it. So the Bureau of Cannabis Control does a, a criminal background for all licensees. We are also putting that as our enhancement because they, they go to a state and they go through the background process. I've spoken to Bureau of Cannabis Control. The application is completely filled out, but to their own admonishment, they don't necessarily get it done right away versus when we do it, we would look at that right away and we, we'd know who our operators are. Bureau of Cannabis Control also doesn't necessarily have to share that with us, nor do they share that, the findings of what they find on their records with us. So we would wanna know who also are our business owners. Um, in terms of surveillance um, systems, I, like I said earlier, we would 
make that redundant so that the wording would be so that we can um, view it up upon our request versus what the Bureau of Cannabis Control sets in there. May I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. Criminal background investigation of the owners. Mm -hmm. How do you, I'm sure you've had this in seminars, how do you avoid the shadow ownership? So you know what I mean by that? Where the person that's applying is not the real owners because the person that really owns it would never pass the background check. So, I mean, the we would background the majority owners mm -hmm. in terms of what is defined as an owner um, there's always going to be that luring you know person in the back that's never on paper and we would do as much background as we could to see if there's any cross reference to any any names that you know shell companies have in place so we would do that on our own but th we would just background the owners at this point are you privy if there's multiple owners to any previous um law enforcement enforcement problems in the past yes we can definitely call the local jurisdictions where you know we can up to where they reside whether they had other businesses and get kind of the the local record of what's what's the complaints based there okay and then just one other avenue I just have to ask then because banking and and I understand cash business and all of that but is there a way through that to trace who's who doing what that or I would not know how to okay. answer that on, on our end. Um, as you also, without it, for questions for you. Sure. Did I answer your question? Okay. So also for hours of operation, um, the Bureau of Cannabis Control designates that they can operate between 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. We're going to limit that to 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. in the draft ordinance. What disqualifies someone with a criminal background from operating a cannabis business? Um, it, it would be a totality um, of the backgrounds in terms of, you know, felonies in regards to um, human trafficking, um, drug trafficking, RICO acts in fe on federal level. Um, there's a guideline that we would go through to find out if what those convictions were. And on the state level, it's an automatic disqualifier. If they have a felony for human trafficking or drug possession in terms of non-cannabis, obviously, if it was, you know, a controlled three drug, it's an automatic disqualifier, so they wouldn't even get to our process. So, so does anyone who'd ever been convicted on cannabis in any enforcement, yes. does the state exclude them, or do they recognize that some of these people may have been doing the business before it was legal, and they could legitimately know how to operate <laughs> a good business now? Correct, yes. Yeah, so that has uh, that has happened um, and when the voters put the law in place those a lot of those records or those convictions were either reversed or forgiven mm -hmm. so that that that's the Bureau of Cannabis Control's standpoint is we're not going to consider that because they were trying to do I mean they were trying to do business but they couldn't but now they can so um, if I may Apologies, uh, it's been a long day. So, are, is this is is staff making a recommendation here? Are we still just trying to navigate our way around, kind of what other cities have done, where there've been some pain points, which direction we should go in? I mean, cause I was just rereading the uh, the write up from John here. Is just to provide more direction, right? And so, are we going to, as a commission, are we going to discuss kind of more here, or what do we? Well, are, are you trying to gauge from us if we want to do this um, two-tier process or a more streamlined, you, I think you said a more enhanced use yeah, permit? Enhanced use. Yeah, so th that, uh, that is our hope this evening, that we'll, that you all will think about a little bit more about what it, a two-tiered process would actually look like and we've identified some concerns and what Mario has provided or Commander Garcia has provided is um, kind of an overview of the things we could bake into an ordinance for example you know when you think about the reasons that we would want to regulate these businesses differently and there are reasons right that's been communicated by the council I think it's been communicated at this level too and by the community these are businesses that by their nature warrant 
you know, an extra careful consideration. Um, so we're identifying things that, again, can be uh, called out as standards, basically, for businesses to comply with um, from the outset. So it's not like they're going to have to freeform tell us how they're going to comply with these certain things we're really concerned with. We'll be able to tell them, no, this is what you have to do at a minimum. Um, and yes, the the you're picking up correctly on our tone that from an implementation standpoint, from staff's perspective, we think we can achieve this with a with an enhanced use permit versus versus the two tier. Um, so, it's it's up to your uh, discussion. And if you need more information and have more questions, can you, so this this is your last bullet point slide. Could you go back, please, to the one where you sort of break out the advantages of of the one tier? There, thank you. Um, the first bullet point <coughs> strikes me as well, I'm sure I understand sort of what you're what you're what you're what animal you're describing to going to instead of a two tier uh, version where our our findings um, kind of take everything the whole of the record whatever that is and make a determination that allows for our discretion to look at that and conceivably weigh some portion of the record more highly or strongly than others because whatever reason we have as opposed to the results coming out of some pachinko machine where it's two for this and three for that and four for that and the answer comes out at the bottom. Right, it's a more holistic review. Um, so That's right fine. now the findings we have are limited to the typical use permit findings. That's talking about compatibility with adjacent uses, impacts to public health and safety. Um, it kind of is, it's silent or it's not explicitly asking also what are the merits of this business, which that's what we heard a lot from the city council and from you all that it does matter the merits of the actual business operators and owners. Now, of course, in the use permits that you guys see now, you always get a business operations plan and, and, the, and the business owners typically or the representatives come and talk to you guys so you can get a sense of who these uh, owners are and what their ethos is. So what we're suggesting is rather than have that be the way it is currently, which is kind of a, I would say, kind of bonus layer or like extra um, provision that you guys aren't necessarily making your findings on. It's just kind of an enhancement uh, to our existing process. What we would propose is actually, you know, maybe craft specific findings so that when you're approving a use permit, it's not just the compatibility with adjacent uses. It's not just public health and safety, but you could, you know, we could try to craft something where um, you're looking at all those kind of uh, business specific qualities that a ranking or scoring system would otherwise be be trying to evaluate but you're looking at it in a holistic fashion with you know a, the use term application for operation at a specific site with a specific site plan premises diagram surveillance and everything else that goes along with that so is it it seems to me that so two-tier system with a very empirical kind of a, a ranking structure gives you a, an empirical result that we could say, you know, their number's lower, their number's higher. Um, whereas this version, the one-tier version, seems to be less empirical or less uh, numerical or empirical. Are you that's sure what that's an accurate way to look at it? And and so why is this better? Sandeep, did you want to? I think it's less efficient to do a two-tier system when there's only three or four possible locations of building sites to make someone, like 100 people, fill out a initial application where they're going to get licensed, and then you rank all of these people, but then only four are actually able to get a possible location. So it's like a bunch of people that are going to be applying for only like four spots that are potentially open. Isn't that as likely to happen with a less empirical, more holistic version? Yeah, well, I think what they're saying is if you can't get a location, then why are we ranking you? May I ask yes, a that's question? part of it. Are, are you charging a fee to screen these? Because we're of talking course. about, all right, and, and in terms of the other cities that have, you provided us with background on, 
sometimes the application fee is quite high. And that, in effect, screens out certain people. And I'm, I'm not clear on, we discussed this, I know, the last time, whether or not in order to have an application considered, whether or not they already had to have a statement from a landlord that they would be granted a space upon securing a permit. Because could be to go through the whole process and they can't get a space is a waste of their money and right. staff time. Which is what's happened in a lot of other cities. Um, of course, we have the ability to, if you guys went or recommended a two-tiered process to council, we'd have the ability to say, in order to submit a license application, you have to have a physical address or a, a landlord or a property owner statement authorizing you to but don't we talk about this Why? also and say it's kind of like a catch-22 because sometimes landlords are like, well, you don't have a license. Why would, I, why would I tie myself to your particular? Right. There's risk for the applicant for sure. Okay. Uh, but, but from the city side, if you would rather, you're not, you know, we're not necessarily partnering with businesses to, if that's something that we needed in order to make sure we're only dealing with real uh, potential applicants that's certainly something we could do so I have a question then are you talking about where each and every permit to be considered would come before the Planning Commission for a hearing until you get to four yes that in a one-tier process yes okay and I, I question that only because the other um, other cities utilized sometimes subcommittees. And I, I wondered, have you questioned, the council has a subcommittee, a cannabis subcommittee, whether they were to be involved in this and whether they want to be. We have not gone back to the subcommittee. It's now in your jurisdiction as commission since they, the council initiated the text amendments. Okay. So um, if it was a two-tier system, and people were first applying for the licensing and then getting ranked, they would be paying money to apply for those licenses. And then if they didn't get the, if they weren't ultimately approved, would they get a refund on their licensing fee? No, the fee we would collect would be to cover the time. Cost for and cost the analysis. And if you had a one-tier system, then would the fee be higher because it would be more in-depth? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so I think we talked about this last time it's likely that our existing use permit fee is not adequate to cover the additional staff time, especially since there'd be such heavy p uh, police review, which isn't something that we have taken into account in the past for our standard use permit. So yes, we'd, we'd have a higher fee for these specific use permits. So it, it, isn't that enabling where we talk about trying to make more of an even playing field between big and small business, the two-tier system, it seems, would provide that because if the first tier is where they have to pass a background check before even moving on, I, and, and I'm, I don't have the slide with the two tiers, what was involved, but if that was the first tier, and if they don't pass it, it's a smaller fee. And then if they pass it and they go on to the next tier, that's another fee that's more comprehensive to cover more comprehensive staff time. So I, I don't know that that I can one give an advantage. educated answer to that because we'd still put in quite a lot of staff time in a Absolutely. in a license application right. review too. But if you had, it, you see, I guess part of this is we don't know if, okay, if we say it's just four, if we're going to have 20 applications or four applications. And so it, it's, it's burdensome in that if you're going to go through this whole process on all of those, the two tiers an advantage because you're going you're gonna to learn a lot in the background checks. Am I right? Correct. And that may weed it out automatically down to a smaller number. Well, but, but wouldn't, I mean, wouldn't most sophisticated applicants know their backgrounds and have a pretty good feel for whether they have a chance of passing that first tier or not? Yeah. And I would hope bother. so. And I would hope. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's a it's a big uh, burden on the app on the applying public to run the risk of failing a, a first yeah. year security application. Um, they know what they've done because they've also I mean they also have to pass the state licensing right, right? And, and presumably our, our criteria so. would be well let me ask that 
if we didn't go two tier and went one tier and the security application is, is wrapped into the holistic package, um, would the criteria, uh, it's late, I'm trying to get, <laughs> I'm be articulate here, would the, um, would the pass fail criteria for background be reasonably clear so they would know if they're going to pass it or not? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it would be, it w it would be the same whether it was combined in a one tier versus two tier. The, okay. the conditions would change for background. It'd be right. There are some that are just the non-negotiable fails are clear. Yes. Okay. So, like, if we did a one tier, state licensing would be a prerequisite. Is that is it, that's my understanding? Is that right? Um, no. The way that we currently work and the way the state licensing works is yeah. you, they have to get local authorization first before they can get a state license. And we require a state license before they can operate. Um, so they first come to a use permit, then they get their state license, then they get their uh, ability to operate here in town. But they don't need the license to apply for a use permit. Would we incorporate all of the state requirements into our use permit to sort of... For background checks? Yeah. For and security? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we would could definitely incorporate that by reference. Basically, we we would we would reference like back to that they would still need to because they would they would still need to get the state licensing, so they would have to fulfill both. And we they'd be doing it basically earlier than earlier they otherwise than. would. Will uh, we be will we be incorporating all of the state requirements into our use permit requirements? Would there be? Uh, let me put it another way. <laughs> Is there any way we could avoid issuing a use permit where they were then later rejected by the state permit? Yeah, that would be the whole point. We would not want to have regulations, and we couldn't have regulations that were um, less stringent, I suppose, than the state, right? Okay. Like so we then could we would say we don't, we don't care about a felony for this, but if the state does, then sure, it would go through our process, but then not get a state license. So no, we would not structure... So our requirements will be either equal to or more stringent than state requirements. Okay. So if you have a limit of four permits, and s if we don't have a requirement for securing the retail storefront, and if someone secures a permit, because we, we have a little bit of this going on right now with businesses that have permits but haven't gotten going. But if there's a cap and nothing happens because they can't find a location. Can there be a term out on this? Because then essentially they're holding one of the four permits and preventing someone else from operating. That would be just for a use permit approval? Yep. So under our use permit regulations, the applicant has to use the use permit within a certain amount of time or else it, it's null and void. Okay. What's, what's the time period? It's, well, let's look. Sorry, it is 10 o'clock. It's not years, <laughs> I guess. Um, I, I want to say it's six months. Or is it a year? Mm -hmm. I'll pull it up in a moment. Can I follow up on that just one second? Mm -hmm. I, would, I, I think I misunderstood something. In your proposed structure, an applicant would not have to have a, a site av uh, available and ready to complete the use permit application and get the use permit. Is that, is that the case, or do they have no. to have a site? It's a use permit always has to have a site. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. okay. So there really isn't a, a, a danger that someone could get a use permit, but it's but not have the place yet. Um, no, no, I think what Commissioner Mackin was saying is if we're only allowing four businesses to operate and we have a one-tier system, the only way to control to get to that number four is saying, well, we can only have four use permits active at one time, mm -hmm. right? That's what we'd be limiting. So if someone wasn't, someone was granted a use permit that then didn't actually use it, they'd be holding up okay. one well, of the permits, but, but until such a time it expires. You're bringing up a good question. Why would someone make a lease agreement with a retail site if they didn't have their use permit? Because you'd be stuck with the lease you couldn't use. Right. Well, I, I assume they would envision some sort of Commitment by, by the, the I mean, they could always be landlord. 
contingent on securing right, the use right, permit. Right. 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 But there be a I think that's usually how a lot of these borderline businesses well, yeah. do it, I would imagine. It's kind, of, it's kind of their problem, but I think that's how they would do yeah. it. Sorry, it's one year. So it would be held up for a year. Right. If, if they weren't able to, uh, it's operating. So can you clarify for me? So if it's a two-tier system, let's say 20 applicants can, you know, tr you know, they want the use permit, then we would score them. Let's say 20 get their licenses, then we would score. But if, if it's a just a one process enhanced use permit, it's first come, first serve? Mm -hmm. Okay. Basically. So it would have to, you know, be a business that's secured landlord authorization, which, again, if you did a two-tier process, we could also build that into the initial license, too. We have the ability to say you can't apply for a license even unless you have landlord authorization. Um, but, yeah, that, that would be the idea for one tier. So for a one-tier system, could we put requirements like we want them to have a design for us? We want to see how this is going to look. Can a subjective criteria like that be put in like place? A design review? Yeah, a design of how would your store look like? Mm -hmm. You know, um, security. Step. You know, just just everything. You know, um, to address, um, for example, the issue of like, there's not going to be a security person outside. Is there going to be yeah. someone in the lobby? Like, what is your, what's the yeah, flow going to look like? That would all be part of yeah. the local enhancements that um, Commander Garcia was going through. So, oh, sorry. Um, yes, we would the what staff would suggest and provide in a draft ordinance. And this, I should say, this is regardless of if we do a two tier process or one tier. We are going to want to make sure our security requirements are laid out up front for everyone to comply with, no matter where it happens in our process. Um, and that includes how security is going to be addressed. I mean, all those things will be addressed whatever process you guys decide on. I mean, it, it seems like Don't worry almost about every that. use yeah. permit we've seen so far has actual plans and actual drawings and dimensions and everything. I it certainly would be yeah. a little less stringent than that for this. Julie? No, I'm just, I'm just wondering to the extent that we have, um, that, that it can be a subjective decision, for example, if we didn't like the aesthetics of it. Or how? Do you mean in exterior aesthetics? Because you're meaning interior both. I For don't example, know that we ever as a regulate the design, like interior design. Uh, well, but of example, course we have design review for... For if example, if they wanted interior. to put fencing around their property or this and, you know, and it, and so we're, w let's say we want to make this, you know, storefront something that's more palatable to the public, something that they can that you wouldn't feel like this was some, a place that you shouldn't go in, you know what I mean? So how much of that can we control in terms of the design of that? Or, or, um, or what things they could put in place in an exterior? Mm -hmm. I mean, fencing is something typically that commission could, if you wanted to say, you know, no, uh, I don't know, no picket or iron mm -hmm. fences. We only want nice, like, wood one. I don't know. You could... So you could certainly have standards or conditions on a permit of if you wanted a specific type of material used. I mean, it's hard to walk the line between design review and, but I know that we've addressed in use permits, I think, you know, things like fencing and that sort of thing is in your, in your purview. Yeah. Yeah, it, I'd agree with what Julia has just said, and I, I think it, it's probably going to be probably permit by permit, and I, I don't know. I think if you, whatever you build into the use permit conditions, I think probably give you some flexibility there. Yeah, we could have a finding that relates to, um, I don't know, the relationship of the storefront to the street being, I don't know, I, sorry, at 1010 I can't craft really eloquent findings <laughs> at this moment. But yeah, it's certainly something we could uh, look at as an actual finding if that's something you wanted. So, so I have one. This is my last question, given the hour as well. But um, I'm going to use the B word, Baylands. That if and when our commercial real estate space increases substantially, does that sort of change the dynamics of how many applications are likely or advisable or desirable? Um, not now, because we haven't been given direction for these types of businesses to be permitted in the Baylands. 
So if a future council or the current council or someone at that point decided that they wanted this use in the Baylands and we adopted zoning text amendments, then sure, that could change things. But currently it's just central central Brisbane, our, our commercial districts or what they would be able to Can I segue in. off of that point where you mentioned in the staff report some jurisdictions cap licenses within individual districts? And I know from just past council meetings there have been some concerns both council members and public about would Brisbane Village have two shops? Would Visitation have two shops? And so we could feasibly say within NCRO 1 and 2 that there could only be one in each, whereas the Baylands or Crocker could feasibly have more because it's just a bigger area. But that's, well, is that no still an option? Not now. Um, it's an option, obviously, for you to make a recommendation to council. I would just say as background that the subcommittee, the city council subcommittee did talk about uh, business to business buffers, mm -hmm. meaning like should we actually be separating uh, businesses or even they talked about limiting businesses in a district and they ultimately didn't make that direction to you. Of course, that doesn't mean you can't have an opinion on that and if that's something you feel strongly about, you can put forward a, a recommendation to do so. But it's something they talked about and, and it wasn't identified in their direction. Okay. So, is, so the, is the purview of this perspective Cannabis ordinance, um, just central Brisbane. Yeah, so the definition. districts are. Sorry, I say central Brisbane, but yeah, I'm really I kind of just mean everywhere. But the I'm being sloppy, but that. it is. These are the districts. There they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, it's getting late, and we have someone from the audience who would like to speak. So um, Michelle Ditzitzer. Hi, um, thank you for being here, and I'm going to try to keep it short um, and for your time. Um, you know, we've kind of been here from the beginning um, when we were just forming ordinances and getting, you know, having cannabis being spoken about at city council. Um, we were very lucky to be able to get, um, you know, a, a, a permit. Um, however, being in the very beginning and with the state still figuring everything out, it was very challenging to find a property and to work with the, the requirements of getting that property into where it needed to be. And um, it was extremely difficult to go through all the different stages that we had to go through. Um, the process now is a little bit easier. They've, the state has simplified and made it more clear, um, provisional. It, there's no more temporary licenses. This has been three years in the banking for our business. Um, you know, I'm, we are going to be coming back to you in a few weeks with our own business again. However, I do want to speak about the process that, you know, Julia had mentioned is the amount of effort it takes to put this type of plan together is, it, our heart and souls go into it. And the when we present it, you know, you, know, you were mentioning about the type of story you present. Um, the business plan should mimic that. The business model should explain what they're trying to do in the store, the, the, you know, the vision behind um, the store. Um, I want to kind of really iterate that um, it is very difficult to find a facility in, or a land for a storefront. I would love to have uh, a storefront in Brisbane, it's, but I still can't find land. You know, this is a goal for me, but I still can't find a facility, so if anyone has any recommendations. Um, but it's extremely difficult. Um, so it, adding another layer of difficulty for small businesses or for anyone really, it's just cannabis in the industry goes through a lot. Um, and we really, the people who want to do good are the ones that you will be able to talk to and see who you want to approve. And I, I do agree that there should be standards and um, security plans and uh, financial plans. I understand it's very difficult and you only have form permits. So I understand the requirements of needing to see all that. Um, also, one last thing I wanted to bring up, um, something I spoke with uh, staff about earlier is to consider um, consumption lounges and how that interacts with storefront or uh, dispensaries. Um, San Francisco consumption lounges and um, dispensaries are, consumption lounges are held at storefronts. They are a really strong and great idea because it gives a designated and safe place for people to consume. 
um, and it is also a way to bring um, people to a, a community, right? And I also think it also is a great way to bring revenue to the city. So I just want, when we're talking about this, to also consider what consumption um, requirements you'll allow uh, with the storefronts. Um, I hope you'll consider uh, recommendations, and thank you again for being here all day and all evening. Thank you. Okay, Odessa Vitpadal. Oh, okay. Sean Kali Rai. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is uh, Sean Kelly Rye. I uh, am a lobbyist in the industry. I work for Kaliva, who's currently operating in Brisbane, and I also am, am the founder of the Silicon Valley Cannabis Alliance. Back in 2014, 2015, I helped seven of the 16 dispensaries in San Jose uh, get their licensing. Um, the one-tier process is actually pretty good. I do like uh, Commissioner Gooding's suggestion of um, having some empirical basis in there. Um, quite a few cities have done um, the following. To, to limit the total number of applications, they've tied uh, the fact that you can only submit an application when you find a property. I'll tell you what happens when you don't do that. Stockton. Stockton said that you can do, you can, anyone can apply for an applica application and you can have multiple applications on the same property. So one landlord would have 10 different applications on a single property. Mm -hmm. They had over 200 applications. San Jose said find a property, fill out the application process. San Jose uh, went from a, a city that had 130 illegal dispensaries to 16, purely based on land use. When you limit or you apply some sort of structure to the application as far as first you have to secure the property, then you can come and make an application, it changes the dynamic entirely. First of all, you weed out folks that are probably not interested or, or just want to apply because it's a numbers game. They go everywhere and apply everywhere, and it's sort of a, you know, throw spaghetti against the board and see what sticks. So you eliminate those folks. There's also a, a financial contribution that you have to make with the landlord, right? There's a letter of intent, or there's a lease, or there's something that, that is uh, uh, binding, and, and that requires some sort of cash outlay or some sort of commitment between the tenant or lessee and the, uh, the owner. So it makes it more serious. If you're serious about making an application, you're going to go through that next step. Um, it is hard to find property, and it's really because Brisbane's size. If you were just bigger as a city and had more industrial space, um, that's really the limiting issue. Landlords all over are difficult. It's federally illegal, so if you have a federal loan or anything that's tied to federal insurance, you are not going to lease. If you're tied to a pension fund, or any sort of a, a CTA fund or anything like that with teachers associates, anyone else, you are not going to get in the cannabis business. There are very strict limitations on what lenders will allow, whether it's federally regulated or not. So just in general, even in San Jose, you went from 130 to 16. You just finding property is difficult. So I, I would limit at, you know, and would help staff for sure as far as uh, bringing down serious and the total number of applications if you had some limiting factor in there like First, you should have a property to submit an application. Mountain View did this. Um, and they, I think, uh, then they had some other criteria that they did, but then they uh, changed that up. Union City did this. Um, and so they didn't have a whole lot of applications come in, and people that came in were serious. Um, the second thing you can do, because I, I do believe in a subjective process, is um, that's how you get your best applicants, is some sort of scoring process, is either through staff or by hiring an outside consultant um, use all their criteria. And then if you want some sort of local component, then you can add that criteria on there for the scoring. So if you're a local business owner or if you're a resident, you can get five points more. If you're a small business, you can get three points more. Or whatever that criteria that you want to add on there in addition to what, uh, there are a num number of companies, HDL is one company that's done at least 75 or 80 cities in the process. So you're not reinventing the wheel and staff isn't unnecessarily burdened um, so you, you ha and they have they have a it's a one tier process where you fill out the application, it's scored, and then they go to an interview. In case you do didn't do so well on the application process, but you're better better verbally, they'll give you that opportunity to come back in and talk about why your business should probably be in the city. And so, just the vetting through that one tier process is pretty rigorous. Uh, it is expensive. That, that in this industry really is expensive. Um, uh, but it also lets you be subjective in who you actually want in your city. 
uh, it does matter. Operators in this industry absolutely matter. Um, and they need to be vetted properly. San Jose didn't have a vetting process. They did it purely by land use. And so of the 16, there's already one that's gone into receivership. It was doing $6 million a year in business, uh, has a lot of employees. One would think that if you're doing $6 million a year in sales, you would not have a financial issue. But if you're not well run, you're just going to have financial issues. I mean, ask WeWork. Right? I mean, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Any size doesn't matter if you're not a good operator. Um, you will have those issues. So, so I think that it's a great idea to have the one-tier system but, but also tie it to some sort of contingency of a property for application and then also um, have a scoring system and, and think about contracting with, with a company like HDL or SCI or Muni Services, which have all worked sort of throughout uh, Redwood City has used one of those companies. Uh, I know um, Union City has used HDL. Muni Services bit has been used here and there. And so if nothing else, um, you can pass that cost on uh, the city may have to make the initial outlay, but you can pass that that cost on to those that win the application and just say, listen, as a part of the cost recovery, they cost us $50,000 to go through this process. You have to spend, you have to reimburse us that that cost uh, over the four, four licenses. Um, and, and so that's sort of an equitable way of doing that, uh, that process. But the industry itself is hard, and you want to be selective uh, in who you have in the city because I don't – think you want to have a lot of complaints down the road as to who your operators are if you have sort of an arbitrary process and that's why I never um, you know favor a lottery because you really don't get to see or have the applicant in front of you um, litigation will come from everybody who doesn't get a license you can grant 10 the 11th person will sue the city you can grant 20 the 21st person will sue the city losers always sue it's worth it at that point most cities just don't want the litigation, so I end up acquiescing and, and adding that extra license, and the industry's learned that. Um, but if you have a rigorous process that's defensible, you shouldn't have an issue with it. And that's one of the other reasons I would say that you think about maybe having an outside consultant work with staff um, with some base criteria, but then also create that extra criteria that's specific to Brisbane. So um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, and I apologize it's late at night. I have, I have one, too. Good. I just wondered, have you seen any trend in r retail actually purchasing buildings to overcome the lease problem? Uh, yes. That, that is preferable. Mm -hmm. uh, because it, it's sort of a dilemma on both sides. It's, it's hard to find landlords that will lease to you just because of restrictions. Not everybody owns their property outright. Everybody has some sort of loan. Um, but then there's also on the dispensaries, uh, the storefront side, is the rents usually double or triple. Mm -hmm. So in San Jose, uh, it was 80 cents a square foot gross for industrial property. Some people are paying 2 and $3 triple net for that exact same property. The landlords just have a captive market, and they know that there's just so many. And so it is preferable for a dispensary to want to buy uh, property, absolutely. Thank you. In, in those communities where you've seen um, scoring companies, for lack of a better term, um, do the do the heavy lifting of, of evaluating the applications, what's the mechanics of passing that cost through or back to the applicants? Uh, I've who hires who and who pays who? Usually the city does, and then uh, the city pay, uh, pays for that fee up front, but then it can be reallocated back because it's, it's a reimbursement back to the city of funds that, that the city basically had to pay for. Um, so it's cost recovery. And what... What's the ballpark? What does this really cost? Uh, I think the city of Santa Clara most recently it contracted for $70,000, but that was including um, community meetings and sort of you're much further along the process than they were. That was sort of from the beginning all the way to creating an ordinance. You're at the creating an ordinance stage, and so I think it would, yours would be substantially lower um, because you're really talking about maybe assistance with staff with creating a criteria for empirical analysis and maybe evaluation. Um, so... Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for staying. Hi. So, Edessa Bitbadal? Great. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Madam Chair uh, Sayanas. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it. Sayasan. Sayasan, sorry, excuse me. And uh, Vice Chair and uh, Commissioners. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Chair and the Vice Chair for taking a tour of two of the dispensaries in San Jose. We really appreciate the time. 
Um, you can see what the drive is for us now when we're coming up to your meetings. And also, I really appreciate the fact that um, Vice Chair Gooding gave a comprehensive a review of the tour on your um, during your September 12th meeting. So I really appreciate the accuracy and the information that was passed on to all the commissioners. Um, I would like to echo um, Mr. Keller Rye's uh, comments. Again, my name is Odessa Pitvidal. I work with um, Mr. Keller Rye um, with the cannabis industry. Um, and I'm also, as, um, I've, as I've stated in the past, I'm a planning commissioner, former planning commissioner, and have gone through this in the city of San Jose. Uh, absolutely, it's very important to make sure that the applicants have the land. Uh, either they have a, a letter of intent or a lease in hand. That is very normal in retail business. I was economic development director in the past. So I worked with many businesses. This is exactly how they get into business. It's um, more um, gives the upper hand to, of course, the landlord, but there are always conditions that they can put in there. Uh, that really uh, just allows for viability. The second thing that I wanted to say, of course, um, echoing again what Mr. Kelroy had said about having a professional out there who is from third party who, have, who has done this to assist staff, of course, that is um, if there is budget available within the city and such. Um, but one thing that I saw from staff's perspective, which was the uh, team getting together and reviewing applications during that one tier system really works well. Again, as a former staff member, I can attest that when you're together with your team members, you're looking at a project and or an ap applicant holistically. So there is no miscommunication between police and, let's say, fire or uh, planning department that everybody's together really talking about the same issues and kind of problem solving. So if uh, there is uh, that one uh, tier system that is moving forward, I really like that bullet system too that I saw in terms of looking at uh, applications and reviewing them together. Um, again, we really appreciate the time that you spent. I don't want to spend too much time just echoing everything that my colleague said. I really appreciate the time that you're putting and the investment you're putting and questions that you've been asking. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. You guys want to wrap this up or are we done? Considering it's five minutes before your normal adjournment, I think your brains are probably done. Yes. <laughs> um, our intent was to have potentially a draft ordinance for you all on November 14th. Um, so we'll, I'm not sure, something will happen on November 14th, potentially a draft ordinance. Maybe we're going to explore this a little bit more. Um, we'll communicate with uh, the community development director about his take on our conversation tonight. If, if there's any leaning any way, I, I wouldn't want to pressure you guys to say uh, whether tonight's conversation has changed the tenor of your opinions. But if anyone wanted to say something like that, you certainly could. Can I ask, did the, the staff <coughs> consider or, or contemplate at all any, any use of you know, outside scoring folks to, to, to to help develop the criteria in any kind of em empirical way, or it, are there yeah. pros and cons to that? Um, yeah, so that's what a lot of cities have done, who've done the two-tiered uh, scoring process. There's a ton of consultant companies um, who are working with cities on that. So certainly that would be available should the proposed ordinance require that type of review. Um, yeah, whether or not that's, a, sure. So that's something we could consider. Um, the cost, as I think was stated, if the city was to hire a consultant, um, we could pass on that cost to applicants as a cost recovery measure. Um, yeah, I mean, my, what strikes me, doing the math and on the back of an envelope, is that I can very well see what it might cost us and then try to work that back through the applications is going to increase the application cost very, very substantially, given our how small we are. So that it may not be, uh, it may be an answer if you're getting 160 applications, but not if you're getting four or six. Yeah, I think our first inclination from a staff perspective is that we we try to not have to hire outside for assistance. I, I, I understand why. So my, my two cents, and then other folks can change, is I, I'm kind of convinced that your reasons for the one tier process make, make some sense in, for Brisbane. Um, I think they make better sense for other cities, the two tiers do, and, and that might have worked for them. Um, 
I get it, and I, I think I would, I would support developing the, the statute around our one tier system. Um, sure, it would be nice to have something more empirical, mainly because it's more defensible once we make a decision. Um, you know, it's it's always nice to point to say, well, we considered you know factors one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and six outweighed two and three because they're you know some sort of things to hang our hats on. But um, it, in that, uh, maybe this should be run past the city attorney for review in a draft, just because of litigation. I it think. always is. Okay, I I hope so. <laughs> and yeah, I'll just say if. Perhaps what we'll do on the 14th is we can maybe do, we can look at what a two-tier process staff thinks could work might look like versus a one-tier process. Maybe we could even have some draft language for you all to look at. Um, maybe still not a not a public hearing level, but um, we can kind of play out both scenarios a little bit more in terms of actual language for you to react to. That sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So next item is. Items initiated by staff. Do we have anything? I, I think there was a, <coughs> a training, planning commission training coming up. And okay. so if any others that haven't responded yet or wanting to get it on that, please let us know. Okay. Thank you. Items initiated by commission. We have none. Okay. May I have a motion to adjourn until the next meeting of November 14, 2019? I make a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.